Jennifer Lopez's new documentary is getting some mixed reviews, some believing she exposed too much of her personal life with Ben Affleck. First off, we see Ben talk about how he felt exposed after Jennifer shared a private book of their emails and letters. 20 years ago, I fell in love with the love of my life, and during that time, I was making an album called This Is Me Then, Lopez is heard telling a crowd in the documentary. I hadn't made an album since then. Years later, we got back together, and I was very very inspired. The inspiration came after her quote Bible she calls it, which was the book Affleck gave her on their first Christmas together. It is every letter and every email that we wrote to each other from 20 years ago to today, she says, sharing that he titled the quote Bible, The Greatest Love Story Never Told by Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, 2001 to 2021 and counting. Lopez placed the book in the studio and let her collaborators go through it for song inspiration. To Ben's surprise, Ben appears shocked and surprised to find out that Lopez shared this private book he gave her with everyone in the studio. When talking to the artist working with Jennifer Lopez, Affleck discovers that they gave him a nickname. I was like, you've been showing all the musicians these letters, Affleck says in the documentary, and they were like, yeah, we call you Pen Affleck. And I was like, oh my god. In the documentary, we also learned that Ben had some serious reservations of his love story being shared so publicly. I did really find the beauty and the poetry and the irony in the fact that it's the greatest love story never told, he tells the cameras. And if you're making a record about it, that seems kind of like you're telling it. In another scene, Affleck expresses how it was an adjustment for him to have her share their private life with the entire world. Jen was really inspired by this experience, which is how artists do their work, he says. I certainly do the same things, but things that are private, I have always felt are sacred and special because in part, they're private. So this was something of an adjustment for me. Ultimately, Ben comes to terms with Lopez's project after realizing it's not all about their relationship. I don't really love being in the making of a documentary about my personal life, which is why I'm so relieved that I'm not really, well, it seems like I might be in this, but I'm not really, he says, I was worrying for no reason. The movie wasn't about me. It was about the ability to love yourself and that love story is a lot effing harder to find than Prince Charming. Next, we learned Ben had to make compromises when they got back together. Getting back together, I said, listen, one of the things I don't want is a relationship on social media, Ben says. Then I sort of realized it's not a fair thing to ask her. It's sort of like, you're gonna marry a boat captain and you're like, well, I don't like the water. He added, we're just two people with kind of different approaches trying to learn to compromise. Next, we learned in the documentary that some A-list stars declined to be in the movie musical about her life that accompanies the documentary. In the documentary, Lopez reveals Anthony Ramos, the In the Heights star, was offered the role of her significant other in the rebound scene of the movie. The movie. He was going to do the rebound number with me and the glass house, she tells wardrobe supervisor Sean Barton during rehearsals, and he was like, uh, I'm friends with Mark Anthony. Lopez was married to Mark Anthony from 2000 to 2014, and the pair share 16-year-old twins. The rebound scene that Anthony was supposed to be in shows Lopez in a toxic relationship with a drunken partner. The singer, however, never specifically mentions who the song and scene is about. We also see Jennifer crying about a past relationship and how it negatively impacted her self-esteem. She gets emotional as she calls a relationship in which she says she was, quote, manhandled before she hit rock bottom and realized it was time to get out. Though she doesn't name the ex, singer and actress speaks candidly through tears about the experience and how it affected her going forward. Being thrown around and manhandled is not fun, she explains. I was never in a relationship where I got beat up, thank God, but I've definitely been manhandled in a couple of other unsavory things. Jen doesn't reveal who treated her that way, but her long career in showbiz has involved plenty of high-profile relationship in addition to her marriage now to Ben Affleck. Jennifer shares more about her past toxic relationships by saying, quote, there were people in my life who said I loved you and then didn't do things that were kind of in line with the word love. You have to hit rock bottom where you're in situations that are so uncomfortable and so painful that you finally go, I don't want this anymore. A therapist said to me, what if this was your daughter? What would you do? And it was so clear. She called. I was like, I tell her, get out of there and never look back. But for me, it was so clouded and so complicated with so much of my past and my 
own pain and hurt and dysfunction that I couldn't see clearly. It was like looking through fog. Jane Fonda had some honest words with Jennifer in the documentary while on a phone call with her. I want you to know that I don't entirely know why, but I feel invested in you and Ben, and I really, really, really want this to work, tells Jen of Ben Affleck on a call filmed for the documentary. However, this is my concern. Like, it feels too much like you're trying to prove something instead of just living it. You know, either every other photograph is kissing and the two of you hugging. Jennifer shrugs it off and laughs, though. That's just us living our life, says. But Jane Fonda did have a point, and if Jennifer listened to her, it may have saved her from receiving horrendous reviews online after the after both movies came out. After both movies came out. Some saying the movie musical is the worst movie ever made. One reviewer made a list called The Reasons Why This Sucked. I had no idea what was going on in the movie. There was no theme. Actually, there were too many themes. There were so many talented artists who were used more as props. They should have had bigger roles. This movie seems like an ode to herself for nailing down a man. It's not really about love. It's a movie about conquering a man. It's basically telling everybody that other relationships that her and Ben had were just filler until they could be together again. Her kids and Ben's kids are going to be watching this. Do they really need to know how much she loves making love to her to their dad? We all know it's not her voice singing those songs, and if it is, auto-tune should get a lot of credit, the reviewer says. The reviewer finishes off by saying she's narcissistic, way too in love with herself, and for people clicking more than two stars, did you actually watch it? Or are you just clicking on five stars because you love this ego maniac? Thoughts in the documentary on former co-star Jane Fonda's phone call saying, Jane is still very protective of her and felt like you're putting yourself out there to get beat up again. Jane Fonda's concerns resurfaced when she thinks about photos of the couple at the Grammy Awards in which Ben Affleck's disinterested expression became the target of memes galore and gossips about and gossip about Jen and gossip about the pair's relationship. I get real scared, you know, with all that about the Grammys and he looks unhappy and I'm like, oh my god, what's happening? Fonda told Jennifer. Nothing. Lied. Jennifer Lopez also revealed she got multiple no thank yous from more fellow celebs that she hoped would appear with her in the movie. Taylor Swift, whom Jennifer joined on stage during Taylor's Red Tour 2013, declined, according to Today.com. Jason Momoa, Jennifer Coolidge, Lizzo, Vanessa Hudgens, Ariana Grande, and Snoop Dogg also allegedly declined. Khloe Kardashian was another potential celebrity cameo who dropped out. I don't want to force anybody to this who go, it's going to be fun, for says in the film. Nobody wants to say no to me, Benny. I get that, she tells her manager, Benny Medina. But when an actor doesn't like a script good enough or is worried about it, that is what they'll say. Jennifer, who ultimately put $20 million of her own money in the visual album, also admits in the film that the whole project made her nervous too. People are scared, scared to put out there. I get it, she says. Took me a long time. I'm scared. I don't act like I'm scared. That's the secret to my whole effing career. Looking back on her childhood, Lopez also reveals that she felt very ignored by her dad and that her mother was always the center of attention. She got used to being around people who acted that way. Jen felt emotionally neglected as a child, Ben Affleck says. He continues drawing parallels between her longing for approval and his own past struggles with alcoholism. It's a hard thing to look at somebody whose professional life is wildly successful and who on Instagram looks like they're living the happiest life in the world. The thing you discover is there isn't enough alcohol in all the liquor stores in the world to fill up that thing. In Jennifer's case, I don't think there's enough followers or movies or records or any of that stuff. Part of you still feels a longing and pain. Ultimately, that's the work that you gotta do on your own. At number 10, we have seven limousines. Starting off strong with her gigantic and expensive entourage to walk three city blocks. Apparently, she was staying at the Metropolitan when she decided to walk to the Dorchester restaurant, which was three blocks away. Instead of having her personalized bodyguards or a small group of people to keep her safe, she insisted she hire seven limos so she could travel the 200 yards from point A to point B without being bothered. Afterwards, she claimed that exercise and working out is something that makes her the happiest in life. Like walking 200 yards with a full entourage is truly exercising. The entire situation is so bizarre and out of touch, you can't help but recognize it as diva behavior. 
At number nine, we have how she got someone fired for asking for an autograph. A hotel maid asked her for an autograph, which is totally respectful because she's literally Jennifer Lopez. But it was how she responded that made her such a diva. When the maid asked her very politely for an autograph, nothing came of it. But a day later, the maid received a phone call from the cleaning company she was employed with to let her know that Jen complained about it and she was fired from that point on. What makes the situation worse is that the hotel tried to deny it happening to maintain its image. Not only is it shady, but the maid risked it all for little reward. Who would think that Jenny from the block would be such a princess about a fan? At number eight, we have the diamond encrusted headphones. It makes sense to have sound canceling headphones with you, especially when you have sensitive ears. But when they're entirely diamond encrusted and worth almost $6,000, it's too much. One of the more infamous moments she wore the headphones was when she was showing up to the World Music Awards on her personal speedboat. And it wasn't just personalized to her, it was completely custom made with custom love seats that were faux leather and champagne coolers. But because the boat on the water was just too loud, she had the noise canceling headphones. And like I mentioned before, they were entirely diamond encrusted. Like regular headphones just weren't enough. At number seven, we have how she won't respond to her flight attendant. She has her own private jet with her own personal flight attendants, and she wouldn't even make a conversation with them. It was in 2012 when she was in hot water for it because one of her flight attendants came forward saying that she was ghosting her. The attendant in question came up to her and a few of her guests and asked if she wanted anything to drink. Jen looked at her, turned her head away from her, and told her personal assistant to tell the attendant that she would like a Diet Coke with a lime. Obviously, this is jaw-dropping behavior for anyone, even if it is on par for Jen. At number six, we have $20 million to be a judge. While she was one of the hosts on American Idol, she was charging $20 million a season. And to add to it, she even bought out Simon Cowell for $12 million so she could replace him. And to prove how much of a diva she really is, her appearance alone rejuvenated the show. So they were willing to cough up the big bucks just to keep her. She wouldn't just judge people on their talent though, she would often judge people on how they smelled. But according to her, at least she didn't judge people on how they looked. Like that's any better. At number five, we have how the construction crew was not allowed to make eye contact with her. It makes sense when one person's staring too aggressively or with weird intentions. But when it's a huge group of people, it's a little excessive, even for human behavior. She'd hired a crew to refurbish her mansion home, and if she was around them, they were not allowed to make eye contact with her. And they weren't allowed to speak to her at all either. But that's not all. A lot of her previous helpers said the same thing, like her drivers and other caretakers. She actually ended up selling that home for $27 million and bought a new one the same year for 40 million. At number four, we have how she wouldn't shoot a commercial where she grew up. We know from her song, Jenny from the Block, that she grew up rough, and she makes it a point to share her story of triumph and overcoming the odds. But when she refused to film in the Bronx, people were taken aback. She makes it a point to seem like she still has strong connections to her roots there, but refuses to film there. It could definitely be for her own safety, but if she was so deeply connected, you would think she'd want to go back. She was actually filming a Fiat commercial and they wanted to tap into that part of her, but she would only film in LA and they required a body double to film the scenes that were in the Bronx. I suppose no matter how deep your roots go, fame overcomes that. At number three, we have her very specific food demands. We know that the diva makes very specific demands and that doesn't stop when it comes to food or drink. When she was touring back in 2010, she required a completely white room with top to bottom furniture and everything all in white. She also required no catering in the actual room aside from the drinks, which included, but were not limited to, room temperature refrigerated Gatorade, Coca-Cola regular and diet, a lemon wedge with smart water specifically, fruit punch, and plain M&Ms. If they weren't plain, she'd freak out. Also, if she was going to receive a piece of apple pie, it had to be a la mode, or else she'd flip her lid as well. As if it wasn't hard enough to keep her happy, any food catering was to be left outside the door by the person bringing it. Another insane food demand of hers is that when she orders breakfast at a hotel, it needs to be piping hot no matter when she arrives or when it arrives to her room. 
And if it's not, she'll throw a fit. But it's not just a regular order either. It's scrambled eggs, bacon, pancakes, and the rest of the nine yards. At number two, we have her specific relationship requests. If you wanna be with her, you've gotta jump through hoops to prove you're worth the position. When she was still with Alex Rodriguez, she claimed she really loved his physique, but if he ever lost it or let himself go, she wouldn't be able to stay with him because that was a deal breaker and she wouldn't marry him if it wasn't a guarantee that he would remain his shape. And that's not all. She also said that if they were going to be together, he was banned from speaking to any woman under the age of 40 in case he tried to get any ideas. She was 49 at that time, and him having a conversation with someone younger than her made her jealous and uncomfortable. And last but not least at number one, we have how she claims she isn't a diva. You know you've become fully out of touch when you do everything on this list and still claim you aren't a diva. She says she doesn't deserve the title of being a diva because she doesn't feel like she is, which makes next to no sense. But her support for that claim is that she worked very hard to get where she is and that she's still a hardworking person because a hardworking person absolutely can't be a diva with her private jet and her seven limos and her diamond encrusted headphones. Getting somewhere big in life when you come from nothing is a big deal and it's really inspiring to young and upcoming artists. But when you've become that desensitized to your lavish lifestyle, maybe it's time to do some proper soul searching. First up, of course, we have Mariah Carey. Even if you're not familiar with many of JLo's feuds, I'm sure you know that Mariah Carey hates her. That's because Mariah has not been shy about throwing shade in her direction. These two have been feuding ever since JLo started to make music and started to steal her shine. Then when Mariah was asked about Lopez in an interview, she famously replied, quote, I don't know her. Years later, when Andy Cohen brought up the beef on his show, Watch What Happens Live in 2014, Jennifer Lopez played the whole thing off saying, quote, I don't have a feud against her at all. I know from back in the day, I've read things that she said about me that were not the greatest, but we have never met. Like we don't know each other. I would love to meet her and I would love to be friends with her. But then JLo was a little more savage on the Wendy Williams show when asked about the feud in 2016. Lopez said, quote, she's forgetful, I guess we've met so many times. But Carrie doubled down in another interview where she added that she still doesn't know Jennifer Lopez. When Mariah had a mishap of her own during a disastrous New Year's Eve performance, Lopez took a break from the high road and liked an extremely shady tweet about Mariah. The tweet said, quote, ever seen an accident you couldn't take your eyes away from? That was her tonight. If you're wondering where this feud started, it all goes back to Mariah's ex-husband and music executive, Tommy Mottola. After getting married in 1993, Carrie divorced Mottola in 1998 because he was very controlling. And to get back at her, Mottola started up JLo's career and did everything possible to make JLo a star, instead of Mariah. JLo sampled a number of Mariah-esque songs, there were even allegations she straight up copied some of Mariah's songs, but tried to make them more of a hit all because of Matola. But Mariah knows she still came out on top, adding quote, after all that sh Loverboy ended up being the best selling single of 2001 in the United States. So basically the whole feud is over career competition and the fact that Lopez was in cahoots with Carrie's controlling ex. Rosie Perez. You'd think that JLo and Rosie Perez would be great friends, considering how much they have in common. Both women are dancers, are Puerto Rican, and grew up in New York. But the pair are not close, and it would be more accurate to say that they actually hate each other. According to Perez's 2014 memoir, Handbook for an Unpredictable Life, she has plenty of negative stories to share about JLo. In her memoir, Perez shared a story from the set of In Living Color. She wrote about Lopez, quote, all of the girls were coming into my office complaining how she was manipulating wardrobe, makeup, and me, all to her advantage. And added she was acting like, quote, some ghetto b screaming and pounding her chest. Chelo ended up leaving that show after two seasons, but the feud between the pair continued, and Perez claimed that Lopez would speak negatively about her whenever she got the chance. Even worse, Lopez was allegedly two-faced. She would talk trash behind Perez's back, but be nice to her face. Brandy. In the midst of the Mariah and JLo feud, Brandy publicly supported Mariah, making it clear she does not like JLo. In July of 2017, Brandy took to Instagram to share a photo of herself hugging Mariah Carey with the caption, hashtag she knows me. An obvious reference to Mariah's infamous, I don't know her comment about JLo. All the comments were flooded with people speculating over the caption, and the consensus quickly became that the photo was a dig at JLo. However, Brandy later addressed the caption, writing, quote, Oh my god, what happened? I swear to goodness, I didn't know what the fuss is about. I love this pic, and now everyone thinks I'm throwing shade at who? This is funny. 
can't take this one down. I love this picture and whenever I'm throwing shade, it's not questionable, you know that I am. Later adding that Mariah does in fact know her. Mariah supported the post by commenting, quote, I sure do. Even though Brandy is trying to convince us it's nothing shady, I honestly don't believe it. Next up, Nicki Minaj. It's long been rumored that Jennifer Lopez is a huge diva, and the fight that her and Nicki Minaj had while on American Idol brought up both of their diva sides. In 2012, Lopez was a judge on American Idol while Nicki came on to perform, and things got tense fast. After Nikki finished performing, she went over to the judges' table and asked, quote, I was hoping maybe I could come back and be a guest judge. J-Lo, can you scoot over a little bit? J-Lo then responded, quote, I don't know if there's enough room for both of us. Then Minaj took it up another notch backstage when she said, quote, she didn't seem to be having it, but she's gonna have it. But she later added, quote, we were just joking around. But it's clear the bad blood is still there. When Lopez performed at the 2015 AMAs, she sang a part of Minaj's song, Anaconda. But I don't think Nikki got the memo that it was going to be happening, because when the camera panned to Nikki, she did not look happy. Fans totally saw the shade and started tweeting about it that night. Rihanna. Rihanna and JLo started feuding right around the time that JLo was seen getting cozy with Rihanna's ex, Drake. This all happened in 2016, when JLo and Drake took a photo backstage at JLo's concert. Once the photos came out, everyone assumed that they were dating, which probably got the attention of his exes. A lot of fans felt the whole thing was most likely a publicity stunt, but Rihanna took the rumors pretty seriously and lashed out online because of it. A source said at the time that Rihanna suffered, quote, the ultimate betrayal and dubbed Lopez desperate and a traitor. This was because Rihanna and JLo were really tight at one point, and Rihanna even got support from JLo during rough times with Drake. Then in December of 2016, Rihanna unfollowed JLo on Instagram, making her stance very clear. Jenna Dewan. When the pair started alongside each other on World of Dance, they seemed like they got along great. Lopez was a producer and a judge, while Dewan was a host and mentor on the show. But sources revealed that when the camera stopped rolling, the women hated each other. One source said about their relationship, quote, Jenna can't stand Jen's over-the-top theatrical fakery. Jen never fails to ham it up when the cameras are rolling, and she hijacks the show. It seems she'd prefer if Jenna just stayed in the background. The insider continued that JLo is a micromanager who tells everyone else what to do. Because of all her input, Jenna felt excluded and felt like her voice was not heard. Although there is a chance that this feud is not accurate because when Dewan's team was asked about the feud rumors, they denied them. Ojani Noah Jennifer Lopez has been married three times before. Her first and shortest marriage was to Cuban waiter Ojani Noah. Although their relationship ended in 1998, it's clear that Noah cannot stand her. And whenever asked about Lopez, he does not hold back his negative feelings. Back in 2006, he was actually set to release a juicy tell-all book about Lopez called the Unknown Truth, a passionate portrait of a serial thriller. But before it was set to be published, Lopez was able to stop it with a lawsuit. She argued that publishing the book broke their confidentiality agreement, and the courts agreed. From that lawsuit, she won $545,000 in damages, and Noah was forbid from criticizing or casting in a negative light or otherwise disparaging Lopez. Noah's name was brought up once again when he threatened to leak an intimate tape of the two of them on their honeymoon. Lopez then filed a $10 million lawsuit against him. When asked why the relationship ended, Noah blamed Lopez, saying, quote, I was looking forward to being with her for the rest of my life. It didn't happen. She made the choice of her career instead of me. And finally, Jennifer Lopez herself. Nobody has done more to warn us about JLo's sketchy behavior than herself. And some of the things she's done in the past are too terrible to ignore. Back when she tried to score a role in competition with actress Claire Danes, JLo said some harsh things about her competition, saying that Claire Danes does the quote, same thing with every character she does. Then Lopez bashed Winona Ryder, saying that she was not a big fan of her work. And finally, Lopez took aim at Gwyneth Paltrow, saying, quote, Tell me what she's been in. I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. Then in a different interview, Lopez decided to take aim at Madonna, specifically bashing Madonna's attempt at acting. Quote, do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting is what I do, so I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can do that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Aside from dishing out unnecessary shade to other celebrities, Lopez also has a reputation for being incredibly rude to service people. One United Airlines employee told the press how much of a diva she was during her flight. Apparently, he asked if she wanted a drink, and she replied, quote, I just said, what can I get you to drink? But Jennifer refused to even acknowledge me. She turned her head away and told her personal assistant, please tell him I'd like a Diet Coke and lime. 
Even though the stewardess was trying to serve her what she wanted, she refused to look made her assistant speak for her. It's so ridiculous and an unnecessary power play. But this interaction is nothing compared to the maid that was fired for asking JLo for an autograph. The maid later spoke with media and said she asked JLo's two assistants who rejected the autograph. Then a day later, the hotel said that Lopez complained about the incident and that maid was fired. Number 10, sharing the stage. JLo didn't hold back when it came to her opinion on sharing the stage with Shakira at the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show. In her newly released documentary, documentary called Halftime, she labeled it as the worst idea in the world. Quote, if it was going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes. That's what they should have effing done. Basically, it turns out that Jennifer was frustrated with the NFL for booking two headliners and making them share the same amount of time that any solo performer would receive, as opposed to doubling it and giving the women extra time to shine. As a result, fans slammed the artist for coming off as entitled. While it's true that they only only gave the performers six minutes each, the action-packed show garnered immense praise from fans across the globe, with many fans commending the women for showcasing their Latin heritage so brilliantly. What JLo was really mad about though is that previous solo headliners like Beyonce and The Weeknd received 14 minutes to perform, but judging by her complaints, it's clear that she feels offended that they asked her to share the stage at all. Number 9. Cheating Allegations Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck have had an on-again, off-again romance that has been going on since the 2000s, with fans even nicknaming the couple Benefa. I mean, these two just got married this year, after they first got engaged nearly two decades ago. But the timeline of their relationship is a huge red flag and included alleged cheating. So in July of 2002, Lopez filed for divorce from her second husband, Chris Judd, citing irreconcilable differences. But this news broke just months after Lopez had wrapped the movie G. Lee alongside her then boyfriend Ben. Even though she vehemently denied cheating rumors, Ben took out an ad in The Hollywood Reporter gushing about Lopez before her divorce wasn't yet finalized. In fact, even Chris Judd's father, Larry, spoke out against the couple and accused JLo of being unfaithful to his son. He insinuated that the affair started during the filming of Jili. Quote, I thought Mr. Affleck would honor a married woman and not just go right into the trailer, and added that she'd be happier if she'd just tell the truth and no one in her little circle is going to say one negative thing to her, but we'll never really know the truth of what happened. Number eight, music theft. The star has been accused of stealing and borrowing background tracks and vocals from other artists for years. One of the stars who accused her of doing this was Usher in 2005. He claimed that she stole a song that he cast aside while recording his hugely successful album called Confessions. Usher claimed that JLo's single Get Right is actually a re-recorded version of Ride, a song that he co-wrote the year before, which was only available on Line. He said, quote, I hate it, but I'd better get some of the publishing rights or else. I didn't put it on my album because I couldn't get it right, but I didn't expect JLo to just take it. And apart from being accused of stealing the same sample song that Mariah Carey used for Loverboy, JLo was also given songs that were initially intended for Ashanti, which is why a lot of people claim what happened between the two artists was straight up music theft. In September of 2001, Lopez released I'm Real from her second studio album, JLo that she worked on with Irv Gotti. But the song was already recorded and mixed with Ashanti's vocals, which is why you can still hear her background vocals in Lopez's version. Number seven, makeup artist feud. Scott Barnes, who worked for JLo for the past 20 years, has had to deal with so much of the star's crazy hot and cold behavior. In the mid 2000s, the star essentially banished her longtime makeup artist, Scott Barnes, after rumors surfaced that someone had leaked info to the press about her and Mark Anthony's secret marriage ceremony. Speaking on the Jeff Probs show in 2012, when asked about how JLo treated him, he said, quote, it was like I had the plague. But interestingly enough, eventually she ended up giving Barnes his old job back again after learning the truth but apparently failed to apologize for being so cold and ruthless towards him. I mean, she literally cut him off without a word and blamed him for the leak without even confronting him. Barnes went on to say, quote, I went right back to work with her and we just never spoke about it again, which is even weirder. The funny thing is her celebrity makeup artist would go on to work with her for another six years and insisted that they remain on good terms despite the fact that she ghosted him and didn't even apologize for it. Number six, the Mark Anthony romance. Celebrity gossip magazines could not 
get enough of the power couple in the early 2000s. They were absolutely everywhere and it seemed like fans loved the pairing. But their beginnings as a couple were super questionable to say the least. Anthony married former Miss Universe Dianara Torres in 2000, while Lopez was dating Ben Affleck roughly around the same time. But the on again off again couple picked their romance back up while Anthony was still married to Dianara. So less than a week after Anthony's divorce was finalized, the couple surprised fans by getting married in a small casual ceremony in her Beverly Hills home in early June. It really begs the question of whether or not JLo was some kind of homewrecker because the timeline of the rekindled relationship seems really off. I mean, he actually broke Dianara's heart and she said, quote, you go through hell. I cried until there were no tears left until I was numb. I didn't want to eat. I didn't care to get dressed or take a shower. I just wanted to lie there. Anthony's feelings for Jennifer might have been there all along because the two had history, but he should have put way more thought into who he chose to marry in the first place. So in a way, they're both at fault here. Number five, insensitive comments. To give you some background on why everyone felt that JLo was trashing belly dancing. So a part of the 2020 Super Bowl performance featured young dancers sitting in glowing cages, which many people assume represented the immigrant children in cages at the US border. But she apparently had a hard time convincing the NFL to do this and said, quote, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just us out there shaking our effing asses and effing belly dancing. She went on to say that she wants something real, something that's gonna make a statement, something that's gonna say we belong here and we have something to offer. Now, if you're confused about why that was so controversial, essentially she compared the art of belly dancing to just shaking your butt for the hell of it. In fact, that particular line was shared across Twitter and people were big mad. It was just a little culturally insensitive to say, considering the fact that the dance has long been associated with Middle Eastern cultures and it's something that Shakira has become known for, using it to channel her father's Lebanese Syrian Arab roots. Number four, avoiding the Bronx. This one train wreck of an ad campaign led people to openly mock both Chrysler and Jennifer Lopez. The central premise of the ad was that sometimes JLo will drive through her old hood in the South Bronx in a Fiat 500 just to stay inspired. Although it sounds ridiculous, the marketing campaign obviously tried to draw on the singer's famous Jenny from the Block era. Most people recognize the song in which she pays tribute to growing up in the Bronx, which had been a solid part of her image since the 90s. In fact, the singer even titled her debut album On The Six, which is a clear reference to the New York subway train. A press release at the time even stated that she would be traveling through the streets of Manhattan to the Bronx where she grew up. But the ad backfired when the smoking gun reported that Lopez never actually went to the Bronx to film the ad and that a body double stand-in was used instead, calling it, quote, such a breathtaking assemblage of urban cliches, and that was putting it lightly. Number three, the movie line interview. The infamous movie line interview in 1998 that could have almost ruined JLo's career was truly worse than you can imagine. She was 27 at the time and fresh off the success of her film Selena. She basically decided to trash all the other celebrities that were big at the time and tried to trivialize their career and contribution to the industry. In fact, when asked about Madonna, she actually said, said, quote, do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting is what I do. So I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can do that. I can act. And I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. It was so ironic because Jayla would go on to do both music and acting for the rest of her career, and critics also trashed her acting on the big screen. Also, at the time, Madonna had been a star for a lot longer than JLo, so there was no real comparison there. And when Gwyneth Paltrow was brought up, Jennifer almost seemed to laugh and made it clear that she didn't take her fellow actress's career seriously. Quote, tell me what she's been in. I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. Yikes. Number two, accusations of racism. 20 years ago, Lopez was approaching full actualization as an entertainer, but a single from her second album, JLo, almost derailed her career entirely. The Murder Inc. remix of I'm Real, which features Ja Rule and Own Radio in 2001, was ruined by the N bomb that she drops in her final verse. The issue was that the song was an instant hit, so much so that 10 years later, in 2011, Billboard gave it the sixth spot on its 
40 biggest duets of all time list. But rightfully so, people were outraged by her use of the loaded term, not only because she's a Latina artist, but at her level of success, where she has a platform and sets an example to young fans, using such a derogatory word is at best offensive. But as the accusations of racism started to mount against the star, she eventually spoke out to defend her actions on the Today Show. Quote, for anyone who thinks or suggests that I'm racist is really absurd and hateful to me. Although many people think this is not an excuse, it was later revealed that the track was actually written by Ja Rule himself, and apparently he encouraged her to say it. And number one, Fire to Maid. This one is really, really indefensible. Jennifer Lopez allegedly got a German hotel maid fired for asking for an autograph. Fredo Daj was a staff member at the luxury Melia Hotel in Dusseldorf, Germany, during Lopez's stay in 2012. She was a big fan of JLo and worked up the courage to knock on the star's hotel door in Dusseldorf to ask for an autograph and was promptly turned away. Prey claims that she was relieved from her post the day after the incident. She told The Sun, quote, I am an incredibly big fan, so I took all my courage and rang the doorbell to get an autograph, but I was rejected by two assistants at the door. A day later, the cleaning company that employed me at the hotel called and said that Miss Lopez had complained. I was fired right there on the phone. If the incident really happened, it's hard to ignore the irony when you remember that Jennifer played a hotel maid in the movie Made in Manhattan. After receiving a rightful amount of backlash, the pop star wrote on Twitter, quote, come on, thought you knew me better than this, would never get anyone fired over an autograph. First I heard of this was on Twitter, hashtag hurtful. Madonna. Superstar Madonna has been in the game since the 80s and established plenty of enduring relationships with other entertainers who've come before and after her. But that doesn't mean she hasn't had her moments where she's thrown someone the cold shoulder. In this case, Jennifer Lopez definitely deserved it because she dissed Madonna's whole career in that infamous movie line interview in 1998. Lopez was 27 at the time and fresh off the success of her film Selena. It was then that she decided to boast about her own talent in comparison to Madonna. Quote, do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No. She also added, quote, acting is what I do. So I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can do that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Those comments were pretty bad considering that Madonna has been a star for a lot longer than JLo and at the time of the interview, there was almost no comparison between them. It seems like Madonna held on to those remarks for quite some time because in 2009, she went on David Letterman and implied that Lopez tries to copy her by studying her looks on stage. Gwyneth Paltrow. At the time, Lopez was still fresh off the success of Selena and Anaconda, and she was explaining how she felt she was grouped into what she called the bottom of the A-list actresses. Paltrow was a star on the rise at the time, with many films under her belt such as Seven, Great Expectations, and Shakespeare in Love, which earned her a Best Actress Oscar in 1999. When Lopez was asked about Paltrow, she almost seemed to laugh and made it clear that she didn't take her fellow actress's career seriously. Quote, tell me what she's been in? I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. If you have the goods, there's nothing to be afraid of. If somebody doesn't have the goods, they're insecure. I don't have that problem. Although Paltrow took the high road and never publicly criticized the star, when JLo started dating her ex-boyfriend Ben Affleck, she was reportedly very upset about the pairing and said that she didn't think Jennifer is right for him. It's easy to see why she felt that way. Scott Barnes. If you want to see just how long Lopez can hold a grudge, just ask celebrity makeup artist Scott Barnes, who's worked for her for the past 20 years. It's important to note that not all of JLo's feuds and shade throwing has been directed towards the rich and famous. The star essentially banished her longtime makeup artist Scott Barnes after rumors surfaced that someone had leaked info to the press about her and Mark Anthony's secret marriage ceremony. Speaking on the Jeff Probst show in 2012, Barnes revealed that the woman he considered a friend cast him aside for an entire year until it was confirmed that someone else was responsible for the leak. Quote, it was like I had the plague. Interestingly enough, JLo did end up giving Barnes his old job back again after learning the truth, but apparently failed to apologize for being so cold and ruthless. 
which sounds exactly like something she would do. The celebrity makeup artist, who's also lent his talents to Hollywood stars, including Gwyneth Paltrow, added, quote, I went right back to work with her and we just never spoke about it again, which is even weirder. The funny thing is, Barnes would go on to work with her for another six years and insisted that they remained on good terms, despite the fact that she ghosted him. He wasn't even guilty of the leak, but she cut him out of her life for a whole year. Talk about insanity. Salma Hayek. In that same interview from 1998, Lopez did not enjoy being compared to Salma Hayek. Quote, we're in two different realms. She's a sexy bombshell, and those are the kinds of roles that she does. I do all kinds of different things. And as if trashing her career wasn't enough, the supremely confident Lopez also claimed that Hayek had been telling a few lies about the fact that she had been offered the lead role of Selena, the 1997 film based on the life of slain Texas-born superstar Selena Quintanilla. She went on to say, quote, it makes me laugh when she says she got offered Selena, which is an outright lie. If that's what she does to get herself publicity, then that's her thing. The comments were incredibly rude and ignorant of JLo, even though she claimed they were taken out of context in an interview that she did a few years later. But in 2020, Salma Hayek opened up to Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live, saying that in the 90s, she was offered the role of Selena before Jennifer Lopez, but she turned it down. Quote, they offered it to me like a week after she died. It was a little distasteful. They were already planning on making this movie. So it goes to show you how gracious Selma Hayek is because she wanted to be respectful to Selena's passing. Ashanti, while Jennifer Lopez has landed herself several platinum selling hits since her rise to fame with her debut album, she is no stranger to causing controversy regarding how she ends up getting her songs. While Ashanti has never openly admitted to sharing a feud with Jennifer Lopez, the R&B songstress has certainly hinted that she was often overlooked because of the success. Aside from being accused of stealing the same sample song that Mariah Carey used for her song Loverboy in the same year, Lopez was also given songs that were initially intended for Ashanti, which left Ashanti feeling irritated given that she had just landed her first taste of success in the music industry around that same time. Then in in September of 2001, Lopez released I'm Real, lifted from her second studio album with Gotti, but he eventually handed the track over to Lopez even though the song was already recorded and mixed with Ashanti's vocals, which is why you still hear her background vocals in Lopez's version. Ashanti said, quote, it felt bittersweet because I was really excited because it was with JLo, you know what I mean? But I was so mad at Irv because I was like, you know I wanted that record. The whole situation between the two stars always seems bizarre and unfair, and many people believe that JLo outright stole Ashanti's vocals and passed them off as her own. Usher. JLo and Usher had a pretty big feud in 2005 over alleged music theft. The star had been accused of stealing or borrowing background tracks and vocals from other artists for years, and Usher had something to say about this. He claimed that his R&B rival stole a song that he cast aside while recording the hugely successful album Confessions. Usher said that JLo's single Get Right is actually a re-recorded version of Ride, a song that he co-wrote last year, which was only available online. When asked about the whole ordeal, the then 26-year-old said, quote, I hate it, but I'd better get some of the publishing rights or else. I didn't put it on my album because I couldn't get it right, but I didn't expect JLo to just take it. In fact, this whole situation was partly due to producer Rich Harrison, who co-wrote the track with Usher and later decided to use it during recording sessions for JLo's upcoming album Rebirth, using the exact same vocal pattern. So JLo's song Get Right is actually a reworking of a beat Usher had created for his own album. When he scrapped his song Ride, parts of it made it into Jennifer's track and created one of the biggest dance floor hits ever. At least Usher was vocal about it and as a result chose not to work with JLo for several years following. Howard Stern. The controversial radio host Howard Stern is JLo's biggest critic and just doesn't understand her appeal. 
He said so himself on his super popular radio show. Not only isn't he a fan of her music, but Stern has publicly claimed that Jennifer has been rude to him on multiple occasions despite his friendship with people close to her, saying that he does not respect her stuck up attitude. One of the main reasons why Lopez will never go on the Howard Stern show is because he has attacked everything from her career choices to her appearance. Both were judges on America's Got Talent at the same time, and in a red carpet interview with HLN in 2012, he said that Jennifer Lopez was more interested in promoting her career than being a proper judge. Quote, it helped her career. She got very far. She suddenly got back on the charts and the show was good for her, and it became more about JLo. In 2016, Howard compared JLo's music to that of a homeless woman who sang a nonsensical song, and as a prank, Howard's staff took the song to pedestrians on the street and tried to pass it off as her latest hit. One of the harshest things he's ever said, though, was during an interview with JLo's ex P. Diddy, where he slammed her looks by claiming that Diddy got out at the right time due to her aging. Eva Mendes. There was a time where Eva Mendes and JLo comparisons were inevitable. Similar to Lopez, Eva's career began in the 90s. She started out featuring in music videos with stars like Will Smith, Aerosmith and Pet Shop Boys. They were both Latina actors making waves in the entertainment industry in the 2000s. They've both dated A-listers and starred in big budget blockbusters, delivering standout performances that stole the show. However, when these similarities were brought to Eva's attention, the actress was very offended at the idea and felt that it was insulting to be compared to Lopez at all. In fact, Eva even felt that her approach to acting was more serious than Lopez's in a major way and added that JLo manages her career like a business as opposed to caring about her art. Quote, I would like to think I will have a more serious career than JLo. We may be both of Latin origin, but that's where the comparisons stop. She manages her career like the head of a big corporation, whereas the only thing I care about is becoming the best actress possible. While Mendez has made it clear that she never respected JLo's career, at least her comments don't sound too personal and were probably made because she was just sick and tired of constantly being compared to the other Latina actress. At number 10, we have Jennifer's dismissal of bad teacher actress Cameron Diaz when she made the comment that she believes Cameron is a quote, lucky model who's been given a lot of opportunities and how she wishes she would have done more with them. In turn, Cameron made a statement that Jennifer's behavior on set was rather cold as she pretty much ignored her. She also described Jennifer as being someone who was hard to work with. As a clapback, Cameron further pushed that JLo should stick to her day job of singing. However, in the same Jennifer interview, it wasn't just Cameron that she came for. She also took shots at fellow actresses Gwyneth Paltrow and Winona Ryder. For Gwyneth, Jennifer said, Tell me what she's been in? I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. On Winona, Jennifer recalled, I was never a big fan of hers. In Hollywood, she's revered. She gets nominated for Oscars, but I've never heard anyone in the public or among my friends say, Oh, I love her. At number nine, we have radio show host and interviewer Howard Stern, whose reasonings for not liking JLo comes in many forms. For one, he hates her music. Howard's typical musical vibe is 90s rock and grunge rather than early 2000s pop. But not only does Howard not enjoy Jennifer's music, he's also bashed it in the form of jokes on numerous occasions despite his attraction to fairly few pop songs in the past. In summary, it was Howard Stern's show co-host Robin who made claims while they watched her on the floor music video that radio stations were hesitant to play the song since she hadn't been charting for a while. Apparently to further this point, he described that the relevance of JLo being a judge on American Idol kind of forced the song down on consumers' throats, and Howard later accused Jennifer of being self-absorbed because the single debuted on American Idol. Howard further bashed her Super Bowl performance and even ridiculed Jimmy Fallon's praises for it as well. There was also the incident where Howard claims he spent the entirety of his run-in with his friend Mark Anthony, who was married to Jennifer at the time, being completely ignored. This further pushed the established reputation of Jennifer being a snotty diva. Howard's last straw was Jennifer's interview, where she was asked if she found Howard attractive and remained silent while expressing a puking expression. Since 
Since then, Howard has not let up on the insults about her attitude, music, and business choices whenever she's brought up on his show. At number eight, we have Gloria Estefan shade to Jennifer for her halftime documentary spiel about performing with Shakira for the 2020 Super Bowl. When Gloria admitted she chose not to participate with no regrets, she blasted Jennifer's comments about their experience when she sat down with Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live in June. Quote, imagine what JLo would have said if I was third. I literally would come out, done, shake your booty, and out. It was their moment, plus I didn't want to go on a diet in December. This was in light of JLo's reaction to Shakira co-headlining the sports event. Benny Medina said in the film that it was insulting of the Super Bowl to request two Latina artists when one had already historically done the work. Yet Jennifer was the one who was upset about splitting her time on stage, stating that they only had five minutes to sing all their desired songs accurately. Quote, We have to have our singing moments. This is the worst idea in the world to have two people do the Super Bowl. While Jennifer and Shakira communicated about their upcoming performance, Jennifer added, They said 12 minutes. I got a good confirmation that we could have an extra minute or two, so now we're at like 13, 14 minutes. I think Shakira, what we should have is you should have half the time and I should. If it was going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes. That's what they should have effing done. At number seven, we have singer Brandy, who was apparently picking sides when the Lopez Carey feud was at its peak. Brandy had shared an Instagram photo of her embracing Mariah in 2017 with a short three word caption of hashtag she knows me. Brandy's followers were on her like water as soon as the post was uploaded, speculating that the caption had everything to do with Mariah's famously memed, I don't know her. In response, Brandy denied there being any drama, rearranging the captions and then say, I swear I don't know what the fuss is about. I love this pic and everyone thinks I'm throwing shade. At who? This is funny. Can't take this one down. I love this picture. And whenever I'm throwing shade, it's not questionable. You know that I am. Brandy also continued unapologetically with, I've met her several times like the several seats that should be taken. She does know me. And if things couldn't get any shadier, Mariah made sure to clear things up in Brandy's comments with a simple, I sure do. At number six, we have JLo's first husband, Ohani Noah. Despite their marriage being short-lived and ending as of 1998, it seems Ohani still can't stand Miss Jenny from the block. Their nine-month marriage apparently wasn't all that great, as Ohani had been working hard to slander his ex-wife's name on a number of occasions. Back in 2006, Ohani published a tell-all titled The Unknown Truth, a passionate portrait of a serial thriller. JLo halted this project with a lawsuit and claimed that Ohani was breaking their confidentiality agreement. Jennifer won $545,000 in damages, and Ohani was given a court date which forbid him from criticizing, denigrating, casting in a negative light, or otherwise disparaging Jennifer. In the next three years, Ohani threw himself back into news outlets when he made threats to release a sexually suggestive video of Jennifer that was filmed during their honeymoon and resulted in another $10 million lawsuit. In 2016, his appearance on Million Dollar Matchmaker saw Ohani claiming he loaded the blame on Jennifer for their split and how he was looking forward to spending a lifetime with her before she chose her career over him. At number five, we have former NBC World of Dance TV host and mentor Jenna Dewan, who sat on the panel with then executive producer Jennifer. Although the two dancers and celebrities seemed fine during the 2017 reality dance competition tapings, their animosity behind the scenes apparently ran deep. An unnamed outlet source once stated on Jenna's behalf that Jenna, quote, can't stand Jen's over the top theatrical fakery, adding that Jen never fails to ham it up when the cameras are rolling and she hijacks the show. It seems she'd prefer if Jenna just stayed in the background. Every situation, even on off camera is micromanaged by JLo, and Jenna feels very excluded. This alleged feud seemed to be squashed fairly quickly though when Gossip Cop reached out to a show producer and one of Jenna's reps and was informed that their reported beef was misleading. However, given Jennifer's past, can we really be sure of this? At number four, we have actress Rosie Perez. She and Jennifer apparently had lifelong ties with one another that seemed great on the outside. But both Puerto Rican dancers raised in New York have zero love for each other, according to Rosie's 2014 Handbook for an Unpredictable Life memoir. In it, Rosie discusses working on In Living Color with Jennifer in a wickedly horrible light. Quote, All the girls were coming into my office complaining how she was manipulating wardrobe, makeup, and me all to her advantage. Despite Jennifer dipping from ILC after two seasons, Rosie stuck with her words of Jennifer supposedly keeping the flame of their feud burning for years after they parted. The words on the pages of Rosie's book portrayed Jennifer to be a two-faced person who would crap on Rosie one minute but then act super sweet like nothing happened between them the next. At number three, we have artist Rihanna who seemed to be unimpressed by Jennifer after the star posted herself chilling with Rihanna's on-again, off-again reported love interest, Drake, backstage at her 2016 Winter Vegas show. Naturally, Jennifer's snap captioned, look who rolled up at my show tonight to say hi, hashtag love him, sparked massive dating rumors. And it probably didn't help that Jennifer uploaded a follow-up pic of her and Drake bear-hugging and looking overly comfortable snuggling up. While
While many were unconvinced about the headlines, Rihanna was seemingly not here for any of it, which is why she reportedly went on to dub Jennifer as a desperate traitor. According to an unnamed insider who spoke to Touch, Rihanna had felt like she experienced the ultimate betrayal by Jennifer, since they once had a tight knit bond where Rihanna could seek solace in Jennifer for her relationship. Rihanna did not publicly address their rumored issues, however, she did seem to throw some shade when she suddenly hit the unfollow button on JLo's Insta. At number 2 we have Nicki and Jennifer's heated back and forth jabs that started with an exchange during a 2012 American Idol episode, where Nicki performed and Jennifer was a judge. When the female rapper completed her set, she boldly asked, I was hoping maybe I could come back and be a guest judge. JLo, can you scoot over a bit? To which Jennifer immediately quipped, I don't know if there's enough room for the both of us. Nicki seemed to hold on to that comment when she attempted to smooth things over back with The Hollywood Reporter, saying, she didn't seem to be having it, but she's gonna have it. We were just joking around. However, in 2015, things were still just as messy. When Jennifer opened the American Music Awards, performing a medley of songs, which included Nicki's hit Anaconda, Nicki seemed to be unimpressed by her performance, as the camera gave away her emotionless expression, which told us everything we needed to know, as one fan hinted. Nicki came to Jennifer's defense at that point, though, when she fired back with a tweet to a fan explaining, I'm looking at my own face on the screen when I'm looking to the right. I turn back and look at her. At number one, we have the iconic I don't know her rivalry that has been carried out for years now. This beef has been ongoing since the early 2000s, with both stars being repeatedly questioned on whether or not they actually like each other. It seems they can't really decide though. Host Danny Cohen brought up their beef on his show in 2014, where Jennifer nonchalantly played the situation off with, I don't have a feud against her at all. I've read things she said about me that were not the greatest, but we don't know each other. I would love to meet her and I would love to be friends with her. However, she told Wendy Williams the exact opposite in 2016 for her show, explaining, she's forgetful I guess, we've met many times. Andy went straight to the source to speak with Mariah that same year and in response, Mariah reiterated, I don't know her, what am I supposed to say? Jennifer of course took this as major shade and when people were flaming Mariah for her quote disastrous New Year's Eve performance that winter, Jennifer threw some shade of her own by liking a post referring to Mariah's performance as a train wreck. It seems Mariah got the final laugh though because she made it rain shade in her 2020 memoir The Meaning of Mariah Carey, where she revealed her feud with Jennifer on top of slamming Jennifer's ex-husband and former CEO of Sony Music, Tommy Mottola, for allegedly attempting to ruin her career with Jennifer's help. Mariah claimed Tommy tried to sabotage the Glitter soundtrack, Firecracker, and pushed that the movie's lead single, Lover, did not go unnoticed by Sony executives. Mariah also added that Sony rushed to make a single for another female entertainer on their label. But rather than naming Jennifer in the allegation in her sampling of Firecracker on I'm Real that same year, Mariah just concluded with her infamous comment, finishing her statement with, after all that ish, Loverboy ended up being the best selling single of 2001 in the United States. Once a couple 20 years ago, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez are now back together and fans are. Ben is reportedly angry with Jennifer currently after her new movie about their love life was recently released. Insiders told The Heat that Affleck was reportedly scared that JLo's new film, This Is Me Now, would ruin his career and apparently that fear has not dissipated. There is a very real risk that this film will not get the reaction she is expecting. Ben's been complaining to friends this could end up being Jiggly 2.0, they said. It will be especially embarrassing for him considering the career that he has built up and how seriously he takes his projects. He is scared he's made a big mistake getting involved. This is the second project they've worked on together and since Jiggly was so panned by critics, receiving a 6% on Rotten Tomatoes and losing over $60 million at the box office, it seems as though Affleck has been worried about the same treatment and it allegedly caused problems in their marriage. Ben Affleck also recently admitted the romance forced him to make major compromises. Jennifer was really inspired by this experience, which is how artists do their work, Affleck said. They get inspired by their personal life. It moves you. I know as a writer and director, I certainly do the same things, but things that are private, I always felt are sacred and special, in part because they are private. So this was something of an adjustment for me. At a screening earlier this week for the documentary, Lopez said that her husband was a quote, reluctant participant in the whole thing. According to People, she told the audience during a Q&A session, the other scary part was that I was bringing into it my husband, who was kind of the reluctant participant and a silent participant and all. Affleck still admits his hesitancy with having the spotlight on their relationship. It's the first time that she's 
done something as an artistic form of expression that was purely for the sake of what she had to express. It was about bringing out the things she felt inside that she just wanted to say, Affleck said. And I don't really love being in the making of a documentary about my personal life, which is why I'm so relieved that it's not really and it seems like I might be in this, but not really. I was worrying for no reason. The movie wasn't about me, it was about the ability to love yourself. And that love story is a lot effing harder to find than Prince Charming. Celebrity matchmaker Alessandra Conti notes that there's been a shift in how the public engages with famous couples. Navigating the complexities of fame and having a very public relationship was challenging back in the early 2000s, but now it has reached a different level. Every couple who is remotely in the public eye experiences an intense level of scrutiny, especially with the dawn of social media, she told Fox News. However, JLo and Ben have kept a relatively low profile when it comes to social media, and although they're supporting each other at professional events, they have kept the intimate details of their relationship private. This is a smart strategy, and as long as their privacy is maintained, it is a sustainable situation for him and JLo. Ben also needs to understand that whoever he dates, he will be scrutinized in the public eye. This is one of the trade of fame, she says. In the documentary, the couple admitted they, quote, just crumbled under the pressure of being a tabloid phenomenon and it put a strain on their relationship, leading them to call off their 2003 wedding three days before it was supposed to happen. I had a very firm sense of boundaries initially around the press. Well, Jen, I don't think objected to it the way I did. I very much did object to it, Affleck said. And getting back together, I said, listen, one of the things I don't want is a relationship on social media. And then I realized it's not a fair thing to ask. It's sort of like you're gonna marry a boat captain, you want to like the water. We're just two people with kind of different approaches trying to learn to compromise. JLo is no stranger to headlines and tabloid drama though. Let's go down memory lane and rehash some of JLo's most shocking controversies. In 2020, Shakira and JLo co-headlined the Super Bowl halftime show and she was accused of throwing some serious shade at Shakira. Lopez was seen getting into a heated debate with an NFL producer about her idea to have caged child performers on stage, a reference to the living conditions that youngsters face at border detention centers. She said, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just us out there shaking our effing butts and effing belly dancing. I want something real. I want something that's gonna make a statement, that's gonna say that we belong here and we have something to offer. The use of the term belly dancing, something which Shakira is very famous for, left many believing that she was dismissing her co-star's contributions. Jennifer Lopez was also accused of being insensitive to her husband's addiction issues in 2023 when she launched her own brand of alcoholic cocktails. The Let's Get Loud singer put her famous name to Delola, a range of drinks created with mixologist Lynette Marrero. But having only just walked down the aisle with Ben Affleck, a recovering alcoholic, this latest business business venture left a sour taste for some fans. There's also a rumor that JLo didn't used to sing on her old records. Rumors had been circulating for years that Jennifer Lopez had more than a little vocal help on hits such as Play, Ain't It Funny, and I'm Real. And in 2014, fellow R&B star Ashanti appeared to confirm that these tracks were essentially uncredited duets. Jenny from the Block is another Lopez banger whose chorus you may struggle to hear the lead artist on. In 2019, Natasha Ramos said, J-Lo did indeed go in the studio and lay down background vocals over my voice. So I wouldn't say that she's so much lip syncing. However, the backgrounds are predominantly me, some ad libs and laughs as well. Luckily, Ramos doesn't hold a grudge against the Hollywood star, but does against her label for failing to give her proper credit. Last year on TikTok, there was a viral trend going around, fans exposing J-Lo horror stories and some of these are shocking. One woman described the experience of helping JLo at Foot Locker. She said Lopez quote cussed me out because the store didn't have the correct size for the shoes she wanted to buy her twins. But that was nothing compared to the story another woman had after Lopez came to stay in a house where she used to work as a maid. She described how a nail artist was called in to give Lopez a pedicure in bed which the nail tech had to do upside down because Lopez, who was laying on her stomach, refused to roll over onto 
her back. And if you're thinking of making eye contact with JLo, never do it. A TikToker who says that her father worked as a driver for a car company, often used by JLo, said that even a driver glancing in the rear view mirror sparked Lopez to berate him for invading her privacy. Unsurprisingly, her father eventually refused to drive Jennifer ever again. JLo's new Amazon Prime movies aren't getting the best hype, as some say it is the worst movie ever made. One reviewer made a list called The Reasons Why This Sucked. I had no idea what was going on in the movie, she says. There was no theme, actually. There were too many themes. There were so many talented artists in the movie who were used more as props. They should have had a bigger role. She goes on to say, this movie seems like an ode to herself for nailing down a man, Ben Affleck. It's not really about love. This is a movie about conquering a man. She's basically telling everybody that the other relationships that her and Ben had were just filler until they could be together again. Her kids and Ben kids are going to be watching this. Do they really need to know how much she loves sleeping with their dad? We all know it's not her voice singing those songs and that she continues by saying, and if it is, auto-tune should get a lot of the credit. She is narcissistic, over the top, and way too in love with herself. For people clicking more than two stars, did you actually watch it? Or are you just clicking on five stars because you love this ego maniac? Yikes. All right, back to Ben and Jennifer. More inside details of their private life were released in her accompanying documentary that was just released this past week. Early in the documentary, Lopez reveals that she showed her musical collaborators a collection of letters that Affleck gave to her as a gift. This book is a book that Ben gave me on our first Christmas back together. It's every letter and email that we wrote to each other from 20 years ago and today, she says. The cover of the thick binder says, handwritten, the greatest love story never told by Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, 2001 to 2022 and counting. Jennifer explains, it became like our Bible and we just left it there in the studio. Ben Affleck, however, was surprised their correspondences were made public. I was like, you've been showing all the musicians all these letters? And they were like, yeah, we call you Pen Affleck, he recalls in the documentary. I did really find the beauty and the poetry and the irony in the fact that it's the greatest love story never told, and if you're making a record about it, that seems kind of like you're telling it. He adds later that he had to adjust to the change. But things that are private, I've always felt are sacred and special because they're private. So this was something of an adjustment for me. Number 10, the Maui Fund scandal. Now who would have guessed that the woman famous for handing out cars on her talk show is being canceled by the entire world? Why? Well, Oprah made a career ending mistake when herself and Dwayne Johnson broke the one rule of being a billionaire. Don't ask poor people for their money. Last week, Oprah and The Rock announced that they would be starting a relief fund for the victims of the Maui wildfires. The People's Fund of Maui was given a solid $10 million to get off of the ground. $10 million donated by Oprah and Dwayne combined. So why is it just Oprah that's getting so much hate online? Well, it's because she has a net worth of, of roughly $2.8 billion. Billion with a B. The world is collectively furious at Oprah for having the audacity to ask working class citizens for charity when most people can barely afford to put food on their tables. The Rock and Oprah donated $5 million each to give the fund a head start. Well, guess what? $5 million to Oprah Winfrey is like 500 to us. Like it's still a lot, but it's chump change to her. Oprah addressed all the hate online, telling the Daily Mail that she was disappointed in the reactions from the world rather than focusing on the good things and the people of Maui. The world was mad that she asked them to give her a nickel. Well, Oprah has yet to confirm if she'll be donating any more to the fund, but so far it's not looking like she will. Number nine, her controversial beliefs. Oprah has had plenty of controversial people on her show, from so-called medical experts to psychologists to celebrities. Whatever is good for TV, it's good for Oprah. One particular incident that caused a ton of backlash for Oprah was when she did an interview with Suzanne Somers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets on how she was able to look so young. According to Summer, this treatment that she does on a regular basis will help. Suzanne claims that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone in her other 
other arm. Progesterone is just a fancy way of saying steroids. She also claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning, and 20 before bed. What really stirred the pot was this woman claiming to be a health expert and a so called self help author. But surprise, surprise, a doctor she is not. Medical experts started bashing Oprah, claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy would actually be the cause of several diseases and illnesses. You know, like cancer. Despite Suzanne's claim that her specially made, non FDA approved bioidenticals are natural and safe, they're actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you can buy from a pharmacy. Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that these methods were useful and even claimed that she used the methods herself to make herself feel incredible. So this lady would rather risk her audience getting cancer than just telling them the truth. Solid. Number 8. The free cars. Who could forget Oprah's famous words? You get a car, you get a car, everyone gets a car. The moment was historical on her series and was parodied time and time again, and it still does to this day. However, what many people don't know is that it was not as simple as here are the keys, have fun. When someone gives out anything on television, there is always a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would have to pay $7,000 in taxes first. While Oprah Studio would cover, you know, the sales tax and the registration for the vehicles, the audience members were given a choice to either pay the $7,000 and take the car or just kind of take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience members, received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new cars. Everything has a catch even now though. For someone who is known for being super charitable and generous, the word free clearly means something else to Oprah. Number 7. She will never marry Stedman Oprah and her partner Stedman have been together for a long, long time, but have never actually gotten married. While Stedman has never explained why this is, Oprah shared her side of the story. According to Oprah, getting married would mean that she would not be able to have her own life, claiming that everything she had built on her own would be at risk, like he was some kind of a career parasite or something. The strangest part about her logic behind this is the fact that she said on air that she wanted Stedman to propose to her as soon as possible, so not sure what that is. Their relationship has survived a lot despite the years of rumors and speculations. However, a source close to Oprah said that in her four years working with the show, she could tell that there was absolutely nothing there with Stedman. Oprah just wanted to portray herself as a woman who loves her man, you know? When in reality, Stedman probably has a house separate from Oprah's, but it's like one fifth the size. Number six, the NDAs. Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Marvel will literally have have someone take you out if even a single line leaks to the public. In Kitty Kelly's tell all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co workers and guest stars were always made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made Tom Cruise's muffin. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign the document. One former employee, Elizabeth Cody, tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was apparently stopped by the courts, still being tied to the agreement that she had signed. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to keep just show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. According to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everyone in Oprah's life. She may have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but apparently that's not how she actually is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was even filed against Oprah and her company because Unicus Performance Training claimed that they were fired for violating the terms of this agreement, specifically involving advertising with her name or the website of the show. That makes no sense. Number 5. Diva On air, Oprah is portrayed as a wholesome sweet lady, but according to her stepmother, there is an unknown side to this woman, hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah is one of the most controlling people that you will ever meet in your life. She claims that Oprah would not allow them to stay at her house when herself and her husband would try to visit, forcing them to stay in hotels with money out of their own pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger when it came to her staff with several people being fired left and right over the years for the littlest things. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows her to stay at her house when she visits, something that Oprah apparently hates. The first time she actually stayed at her stepmother's place, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets were not a thousand threads and that her bath towels were not big enough. Okay, that one I can forgive. Ever use a giant towel? I'm never going back. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything she wants and apparently what she 
wants is to make her family feel like a burden. Number four, the vegan cleanse. Now, when I, when I learned about this next entry, I was genuinely shocked that Oprah Winfrey's show was never considered a toxic working environment. It turns out Oprah was a powerful woman when she was running the show. Oprah was an advocate for a ton of things on her show, but the one thing that she really doubled down on were her views on animal rights. Organizations like PETA praised Oprah for her advocacy, especially when she took it a step further by making her staff join her on a 21 day vegan cleanse. Now, while the cleanse was optional, if you signed up, there was no backing out. You were going to be vegan for 21 days or you were fired. Now, it was never actually confirmed if there was a penalty for leaving early, but according to one employee who participated in the cleanse, they were afraid to back out because Oprah was just so demanding. Oprah was a very serious woman behind the scenes, so we can only speculate what might have happened had she spotted a PA eating a baconator. Number three, spiritual beliefs. Now, I'm gonna start this entry by clarifying, I'm not making fun of your beliefs, okay? If you are spiritual, if you're a spiritual person in any way, shape, or form, please know this entry is about Oprah and Oprah alone, okay? In an interview with Harper Bazaar, Oprah mentioned her daily morning routine that starts at 8.30 in the morning with various spiritual exercises. After reading Gathered Truth, she opens up an app called Bowl of Saki that delivers teachings of the Sufi, followed by some light meditation. The controversy here comes from Oprah inviting several self-fulfillment gurus onto her show and just gushing about one specific one named Guru Gary Sukhov's preachings. Now, Oprah herself has claimed to have secret spiritual knowledge about tapping into personal courage and giving general spiritual advice, but she stopped diving too deep into spirituality after this backlash from her fans and readers of her magazine. They just didn't like that about Oprah. Number two, Wild Child. Several books have been published about Oprah over the years, some from her and some not. In her own book that she wrote, she revealed that growing up she was far from an easy kid to handle. When she was young, she was sent to live with her father Vernon after Oprah was caught stealing from her mother's purse. Despite being an on-screen persona known for charity and kindness, she was actually a menace throughout most of her life according to family members. As I mentioned previously on this list, Oprah's stepmother is not allowed to stay at her house and she's known to be pretty controlling. She admitted to doing some pretty troubling things at a young age, including staging an amnesia bout, breaking several things in her mother's home, and calling the police. According to Oprah's mother, she was uncontrollable, ungrateful, and after robbing her, maybe a little crazy. And at number one, her buddy, Dr. Phil. Oprah is not just responsible for many hopes and dreams being squashed live on air, but she is also the creator of many talk show celebrities, namely health expert Dr. Oz and life coach Dr. Phil. Now, before Dr. Phil had his own show, Oprah had asked him and his courtroom consulting firm to help her with a trial. Before meeting Oprah, Phil had zero interest in being a television personality, but Oprah made him see the light, so to speak. According to Phil, she helped him understand the power of these shows and what they were truly made for. For Phil, he brings people on his show who are struggling with personal issues that just so happen to be good for television. Remember that Catch Me Outside girl? Dr. Phil made her rich and famous. But it's not just Phil that's had some controversial moments, though. Her other protege, Mr. Dr. Oz, has had some pretty rough moments. His show is centered around medicine and health, bringing so-called experts on every week. My mother loved this show. Oprah was partnered with both of these people, meaning that whatever their shows made, she got a little, little something for her trouble. She doesn't like to advertise how much she made from these programs, but considering how many episodes they have done and how long the programs have been on for, it's probably a lot. Number 10, Angelina Jolie. You would imagine that two people who consider themselves to be humanitarians would agree on something, but apparently that is not the case between Angelina Jolie and Miss Oprah Winfrey. According to an insider close to Oprah, Angelina actually refused to help her launch her Oprah Winfrey free leadership academy for girls in South Africa. According to the source, Oprah reached out seeking celebrity sponsorships and public backing for the project. But when she reached out to Angelina, she was met with a swift no. Oprah assumed that Angelina, of all people, would jump at the chance to represent such an incredible cause, especially considering how much Angelina apparently loved Africa. But the no was a devastation and she would never ask for Angie's help ever again. Many people believe that the hate towards Oprah stems from her decision to publicly side with Jennifer Aniston after she split from Angie's ex, Brad Pitt. Hey, uh, to be fair to Oprah, the split came literally weeks before Brangelina became public, so I'm just saying. 
Number 9, Ice Cube. Ice may have gotten his career thanks to his epic music chops, both as a solo artist as well as during his time with the NWA, but these days you probably know him as the guy from Ride Along or 21 Jump Street. Ice Cube started acting in movies in 1991, debuting in the film Boys in the Hood as Doughboy. He continued to act over and over again, starring in movies like Friday, Anaconda, and Are We There Yet? His dislike for Oprah comes from the fact that while he has starred in several movies, and has become more widely known for that, she has never invited him onto her show. She's even asked his co-stars to appear rather than himself on multiple occasions. In 2006, Ice Cube expressed his frustrations, saying that his barbershop co-stars Cedric the Entertainer and Eve were invited onto the show while he was left onto the sidelines. He pointed out how crazy it is that Oprah has all of these people with dark pasts and straight up convictions. Plus, if he wasn't a rags to riches story, who the heck was? We got a little piece of that story in the film Straight Outta Compton in 2015, which is a film that received massive critical success and that was never mentioned on Oprah's show. Ever. Not once. Number 8. Seal. This man may be known for his vocal chops, but he should be known for his meme-making abilities. Just days after the Golden Globes in 2018, Seal posted a meme on Instagram consisting of several photos of Oprah Winfrey cozying up with a man whose name I am not allowed to say on the internet because he's so heinous. He's the guy who produced half of Quentin Tarantino's movies, he's the main cause of the Me Too movement, and for the rest of this entry he shall be referred to as Java the Hutt, because he kind of looks like him. Oprah and Java were photographed spending time together, and one photo even made it look like Oprah was pushing singer Rita Ora towards Mr. Hutt. Seal captioned the image saying a bunch of stuff that I can't quote, gosh darn internet. The meme itself read, when you have been part of the problem for a decade but suddenly they all think you are the solution. I'm not sure how deep this feud goes, but on the surface it seems that Seal has been trying to warn us that something is going on for quite some time. Number 7, Ludacris. Luda. Sorry, I just needed to get that out of my system. Ludacris appeared on Oprah in 2004 to promote the film Crash. He claimed that Oprah ambushed him. With criticism about hip hop lyrics, instead of talking about the actual critically acclaimed movie that he was there to plug. Luda has since claimed that Oprah edited the show to make herself seem more favorable to the audience members. And he said during a separate interview that she edited out all of his comments and kept her own in. Of course, it's her show, but they were doing a show on racial discrimination and she gave Luda a hard time as a rapper when he came on the show as an actor. Luda revealed that his interview was extremely last minute, not knowing if it was a real thing until roughly 24 hours before. Following the interview on Oprah, she pulled Luda aside to the green room where he claims to have been berated by the talk show host. According to Oprah, having a rapper on her show made her feel like she was empowering them. He said it was like being at someone's house who just really didn't want you there. At that point, he had already been so uncomfortable, but that was just a little bit a cherry on top of the, of the Sunday. Her main concern was his use of the N-word in lyrics, but he quickly pointed out the hypocrisy of having people like Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock on the show who were famous for using that slur in their sets. Oprah's shadiness was on full display following the interview from Luda. Nope, I, I can't say it normally. I'm sorry. Number six, Monique. The beef between comedian and actress Monique and Oprah Winfrey dates back to 2010. Monique won an Oscar for her performance in Precious from 2009, and leading up to the film's premiere, Winfrey interviewed Monique's brother, Gerald, who Monique claimed to have been very physical towards her growing up in a truly dark way that I really can't get into. In a since-deleted Periscope video, Monique claimed that she gave Winfrey her blessing to do the interview, but was shocked and disgusted when her parents were in the audience. In the years that followed, Monique eventually forgave Oprah for creating such an uncomfortable moment for herself and her family, and while forgiving Oprah, she does continue to say that she would never forgive her parents for the role that they played and for not doing something about the situation that was happening right under their noses. Oprah really needs to stop bringing people on the show to talk about some darks. It's just not fun. It's just not fun. Number 5, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata, aka an unwelcome person, to Oprah after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turns out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub. Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading
leading to a hilariously adorable moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was mad at her, to which Oprah replied, why am I mad at you? I thought you were mad at me. They mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and settled the dispute, so to say. Number four, David Letterman. A majority of the world believes that Oprah's feud with David Letterman dates back to 1995 after he made an awkward joke at the Academy Awards. But Letterman claims that their beef actually started a lot earlier than that. According to an interview between David and late night host Jon Stewart, David claims that his feud with Oprah began many, many years before the Oscars. He explained that he ran into Oprah when they were both on vacation with other people. He explained that she was with Stedman at the time and David was with his then girlfriend, Regina. David decided it would be really funny to prank Oprah one day at lunch. The story goes that the waiter walked past him and he simply pointed to Oprah and said, this woman right over there has been kind enough to take care of our checks. And then they got up and left Oprah with the bill. Yeah, I'm not surprised that she's not stoked about that. Even millionaires don't appreciate sneaky people. Winfrey has never cited that as being the source of her anger though. Apparently she felt that the feud began when she was a guest on his talk show in 1986. David continued to make rude jokes at her expense and made her feel extremely uncomfortable. She did not speak to him for 16 years after that. David is a strange man, especially when it comes to female guests, so it's not a surprise that she was uncomfortable the whole time. Number three. 50 Cent. The rapper once referred to Oprah as an Oreo in the January 2006 issue of Elle magazine, complaining that the talk show Queen started out with the views of a black woman, but was now catering to the middle-aged white American woman for so long that she became one herself. His words, not mine. Cent even named his miniature schnauzer Oprah as a dig at the talk show host. During an episode of Oprah's The Next Chapter, Cent was invited on to discuss the situation and clear the air. Oprah visited 50 at his grandmother's house for the interview, where he explained that his frustrations lied with Oprah's lack of hip hop artists on her show and just how much she detested the use of the N word. He claimed that he had seen moments on the show when she would discuss her feelings on rap culture and everything that was wrong with it, going on to say that she would occasionally target his music directly. According to Scent, he called Oprah his enemy in the exchange and he has never spoken to her again. Number two, Joan Rivers. The late Joan Rivers actually actually publicly fat shamed Oprah Winfrey on live television during her first ever live TV appearance. Great way to start a relationship. Oprah spoke out about the incident in her book, Food, Health, and Happiness, and in one entry, she tells the story of appearing on The Tonight Show in 1985. All was going smoothly, and she was starting to settle into her role, and that was when she was asked the one question she did not prepare for. Joan Rivers asked Oprah how she gained the weight. According to Oprah, she was just stunned because Joan just asked her on live TV how she was so fat. Her words, not mine. I'm not calling Oprah fat. We do not fat shame here, obviously. Joan was acting as a guest host at the time, sitting behind a desk that was not hers, telling Oprah that she was fat. That is like next level rude. In the years that followed, Joan claimed that she loathed Oprah, allegedly calling her rise to fame completely opportunistic. For years, she believed that Oprah's only so-called claim to fame was her gift to exploit people's suffering and emotions and turning them into TV ratings. Oprah has brought on a lot of people who are suffering from serious hardships, but this is a popular format for many people like Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz. Man, there are a lot of doctors on TV, huh? Dr. Oprah, I guess that just didn't have a nice ring to it. And at number one, Chris Brown. Chris was in some hot water in 2009 after Oprah hosted a domestic violence episode in which she showed footage of Chris's infamous video involving his then girlfriend, Rihanna. After the episode aired, Chris took his frustrations to People Magazine, which is a good place to go. He commended Oprah for addressing the fact that it was a problem, but that it was a slap in his face. He went on to tell people how much he had done for Oprah over the years and how this was a massive betrayal, telling her to be more helpful. Okay, Mr. Brown. Oprah released a statement later saying that she was very appreciative of his help and charity, but that she takes domestic issues very seriously. Chris doubled down by retaliating against Oprah, telling her that she was bashing him and tearing him down rather than building him up. Well, we all know how most celebrities feel about Chris Brown. 
around these days, so I think she was in the right there. Number 10, Angelina Jolie. Despite both of these women being public advocates for a ton of different charities and organizations, when the idea of them working together came to the table, the last thing that Angie wanted to do was help Miss Winfrey out with anything. According to an insider close to Oprah, Angelina actually refused to help Oprah launch her Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa. According to the source, Oprah reached out seeking celebrity sponsorship and public backing for the project, but once she reached out to Angelina, she was met with a swift nap. Oprah assumed that Angelina, of all people, would jump at the chance to represent such an incredible cause, especially considering how much she actually loved Africa. But the no was a devastation, and she would never ask for Angie's help again. A lot of people believe that the hate towards Oprah stems from her decision to publicly side with Jennifer Aniston after she split from Angie's ex, Brad Pitt. So she didn't want to help launch a school for girls in another country because Oprah chose sides once. That's mature. Number nine, Jason Momoa. This man is a few things. Aquaman, the enemy of Dom Toretto, and now he's the man speaking out on Oprah and the Maui scandal. Jason Momoa is a gifted actor and overall seems like a good guy from what we can tell. And a few weeks ago, he posted a video urging tourists to steer clear of the island. Throughout the video, he asks that all those who do not live on the island year round just stay home, remain there, we don't need you here. Many celebrities began to point out the fact that Oprah had just purchased property in Maui before the fires and she had been making regular visits to the island. It was believed that he was directing his comments directly at Oprah. Now, so far, neither Jason nor Oprah have actually commented on each other's positions when it comes to the Maui Fund. Jason has been vocal about his wish to contribute in assisting to the people of the island, but when he speaks about the Maui Fund, he simply refers to Dwayne Johnson, and that's about it. The two of them have paired up online to raise awareness for funds, but so far, there is no mention of Oprah's name anywhere. Number eight, Rachel Ray. While Rachel was once Oprah's mentee, being a celebrity chef turned into a publishing and TV giant, in 2007, she was caught using racial slurs in reference to Oprah. Good job, Rachel. According to Hollywood Insiders, Rachel had been indulging in a lot of no-no juice and food with one of her colleagues. As the night went on, she became more and more annoying loud and aggressive. Rachel apparently called Oprah a few things that I'm honestly not comfortable repeating, even though for some reason I'm allowed to say it on the internet, which is weird. Rachel essentially started berating Oprah for her background and skin color, believing the moment to be private. A rep for Rachel denies that this conversation ever took place. However, another source confirmed the story, adding a few other horrible sentences that I'm again not going to repeat. Oprah never publicly called Rachel out, but she also never defended the woman, and it seems that Rachel has some kind of a grudge and blames Oprah for every single thing that's ever happened to her that's wrong. Well, it's her fault. Number seven, Chris Pine. Chris Pine is not just the go-to guy when Hollywood wants to start a new franchise. He is also a side character from time to time. Isn't that neat? In 2018, he starred alongside Oprah Winfrey and a slew of other actors in the Disney film Wrinkle in Time. While Chris and Oprah shared a minimal amount of screen time together, it may have been on purpose. Oprah is no stranger to the acting world. She got her big break in the color purple, but as time went on, she became better known as Oprah, the lady who gave out free cars and told people to believe in themselves. Chris does not speak all that much about Oprah, especially when it comes to his time on the project, but when he does, it's short and simple. Like, if he goes too far into detail, he may end up saying something that he's gonna regret. Oprah has yet to star in another film since, so maybe Chris Pine has more pull in Hollywood than some people think. Number six, Tom Cruise. The moment that Tom Cruise almost destroyed Oprah's set with his enthusiasm will go down in history as the most chaotic interview to ever be recorded on this planet. In 2005, Tom got a little excited thanks to his engagement to Katie Holmes. Now the interview consisted of jumps, flips, Tom trying to snap Oprah's wrists, and finally a paranormal activity style moment where Tom is running around the studio just looking for Katie. Following the interview, Tom was mocked relentlessly by both Hollywood and fellow TV hosts and personalities. As the years went by, the hate never really slowed down. The interview was never forgotten about, and Tom became a difficult man to sell in the eyes of Hollywood. He started starring in a lot more movies produced by himself. Now, I'm not saying that the interview is the main reason this guy's career is different, okay? I'm just saying that it's when we started to notice that he was crazy. He became so unhinged in 2005 and he was just chaotic from then on. He's never outright looked at the camera and said, I hate Oprah. But his hesitancy to return in recent history is proof enough that he was just a little bit too hyped for Oprah on that day. Number five, 
Ludacris. Ludacris appeared on Oprah in 2004 to promote his movie Crash. Now he claimed that Oprah ambushed him. With criticism about hip hop lyrics instead of talking to him about the critically acclaimed movie that he was you know, there to talk about. Luda has since claimed that Oprah edited the show to make herself look better to the audience. He said during a separate interview that she edited out a lot of his comments while keeping most of hers in. Now of course it's her show, but they were doing a segment on racial discrimination and she basically gave Luda a hard time for being a rapper when he came onto the show as an actor. Luda revealed that his interview was extremely last minute, he didn't even know he was going on that that stage until about 24 hours beforehand. Now, following the interview on Oprah, she apparently pulled him aside to a green room where he claims to have been berated by her. According to Oprah, having a rapper on her show just made her feel like she was empowering them, and he said it was like being at someone's house when they didn't want you to be there, which is awkward. At that point, he had already been uncomfortable, but that was just a little cherry on top. Her main concern was, of course, his use of the N word in lyrics, but he quickly pointed out the hypocrisy of having people like Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock on the show who were famous for using that slur in their sets. Oprah's shadiness was on full display following the interview from Luda, and they will probably never work together or see each other ever again. Why would he want to be in the same room as her? That sounds very uncomfortable what he just went through. Number 4, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, she claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata, aka an unwelcome person to Oprah, after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple, and Oprah wasn't. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud they had was addressed. Now it turns out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 incident. Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading to an adorable but awkward moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was so mad at her, to which Oprah replied, I thought you were mad at me, I'm not mad at you, what? They just agreed that they should have had a phone call at some point and squashed everything, but I don't know. We have that little subconscious voice in the back of our head telling us to do stuff for a reason, right Whoopi? Number three, Ice Cube. Ice Cube may have gotten his career thanks to his epic music chops, both when he was a solo artist as well as during his time with the NWA. These days you probably know him as the guy from Ride Along or the, or the captain from 21 Jump Street. Ice Cube started acting in movies in 1991, debuting in the film Boys in the Hood as Doughboy. He continued to act over and over again, starring in movies like Friday, Anaconda, Are We There Yet, Snakes on a Plane. He really likes animals. His dislike for Oprah comes from the fact that while he has starred in several films, he's become more well known for those. In fact, she's never actually invited him onto the show. She has even asked his co stars to appear rather than himself on multiple occasions. In 2006, Ice Cube expressed his frustrations, saying that his barbershop co stars Cedric the Entertainer and Eve were invited onto the show while he was just kind of left on the sidelines. He pointed out how crazy it is that she's had all these people with dark pasts and convictions. Plus, if he wasn't a rags to riches story, who was? He was a freaking ice cube. If you want to know anything about him, just watch Straight Outta Compton. It's a great movie and his kid plays him. So seriously, it was an incredible film, got massive success, and it was never mentioned on Oprah Winfrey's show. So that sucks. Number two, 50 Cent. The rapper once referred to Oprah as an Oreo in January of 2006 complaining that the talk show Queen had started out with the views of a black woman but was now catering to the middle-aged white American woman for so long that she became one herself. That is a direct quote from the magazine article, 50 Cent said that. Cent even named his miniature schnauzer Oprah as a dig at the talk show host. During an episode of Oprah's The Next Chapter, Cent was invited onto the show to discuss the situation and to just kind of clear up the air. Oprah visited him at his grandmother's house for the interview where he explained that his frustrations lied with her lack of hip hop artists on her show, and like I said, how much she detested the use of the n-word. Now He claimed that he had seen moments on the show when she would discuss her feelings on the rap culture and everything that was wrong with it, and it felt like a personal attack directly towards him. According to Sen, he called Oprah his enemy in the exchange, and he's never spoken to her ever again. And at number one, Monique. The beef between comedian and actress Monique and Oprah Winfrey dates back to 2010. Monique won an Oscar for her performance in Precious in 2009. Leading up to the film's premiere, Oprah interviewed Monique's brother, Gerald, who Monique claimed to have been very physical towards her growing up in a really dark way that I'm not going to get into and I can't. In a since deleted Periscope video, Monique claimed she gave Winfrey her blessing to do the interview 
interview, but was shocked and disgusted when she realized that her parents were asked to be in the audience. In the years that followed, Monique eventually forgave Oprah for creating such an uncomfortable moment for herself and her family. While forgiving Oprah, she continues to say that she would never forgive her parents for the role that they played on the show, in the moment, and of course in the past for not doing anything about the situation that was happening. Number 10, Cindy Crawford. Model and actress Cindy Crawford has called Oprah out over their 1986 interview that took place on her show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Crawford reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV Plus. It's where everybody's got a plus these days. The documentary spotlights the careers of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course, Cindy Crawford. In a clip from the documentary, Winfrey is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked her, did she always have this body? This is unbelievable. Stand up. Now that's what I call a body. Yeah, I know that's not a good Oprah Winfrey, but hey, <laughs> who cares? She is visibly uncomfortable and sheepishly stands up before the studio audience cheered as she showed off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment being told what to do by her superior. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type situation than anything else. At the time, this was just some weird thing that Oprah asked her to do, but eventually it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments of her early years in modeling. The most shocking thing for Cindy was the fact that this was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. This woman known for kindness and generosity was just making her feel like a puppet. Number nine, Seal. This man may be known for his vocal chops, facial scars, and many other things, but he should be known for the meme-making abilities that he holds deep within. Just days after the Golden Globe, Seal posted a meme on Instagram consisting of several photos of Oprah Winfrey cozying up with a man whose name I'm not allowed to say on the internet because he is just so heinous. He's the guy who produced half of Quentin Tarantino's movies, he was the main cause of the Me Too movement, and for the rest of this entry, I'm gonna refer to him as Java the Hutt, because he looks exactly like him. Oprah and Java were photographed spending time together, and one photo even made it look like Oprah was trying to push singer Rita Ora towards Mr. Hutt. Seal captioned the image, saying a bunch of stuff that I'm not allowed to quote because gosh darn internet and their rules. The meme itself read, when you have been part of the problem for decades, but suddenly they think that you are the solution. Now, I'm not sure how deep the feud between Seal and Oprah really goes, but on the surface, it seems like he's been trying to warn us about her for quite some time. Number eight, Ice Cube. Ice Cube may have gotten his career thanks to his epic musical chops, both as a solo artist as well as his time with the NWA, but these days, you probably know him as the guy from Ride Along or 21 Jump Street. That's right, he's the captain. Who Schmidt, well, let's not get into it. Ice Cube started acting in movies in 1991, debuting in the film Boys in the Hood as Doughboy. He continued to act over and over again, starring in movies like Friday, Anaconda, and Are We There Yet? His dislike for Oprah comes from the fact that while he has starred in a ton of movies and he's more widely known for it, she has never invited him onto his show. She even asked his co-stars to appear more times than himself on multiple occasions. In 2006, Ice Cube expressed his frustrations, saying that his barbershop co-stars Cedric the Entertainer and Eve were invited on the show while he was just kind of left on the sidelines. He pointed out how crazy it is that she has all of these people with dark pasts and convictions onto the show. And besides, it's a whole rags to riches type deal when she brings people on. And if Ice Cube wasn't a rags to riches story, then who was? Now we got a little piece of that story in Straight Outta Compton, but we'll talk about that another time. His feud with Oprah has been long standing, and so far it's looking like he is definitely on the opposing side of this whole Maui situation. Speaking of which, number seven, Jason Momoa. Aquaman, the enemy of Dom Toretto, and now the man speaking out on Oprah's Maui scandal. Jason Momoa is a gifted actor, and by all accounts, he seems like a gifted person too. Recently, several news outlets have claimed that Jason is on the opposing side of the fund. According to these outlets, Jason posted a video to Instagram in which he addresses the fires and offers his own support to the victims, but while never mentioning anyone by name, he mentions that some may use this as a way to exploit or to make profit, but that wasn't his intention. The clip went viral, and as you can guess, outlets were interpreting everything they could from it, with the biggest headlines being, Jason Momoa calls out Oprah for wildfires. Now, while not completely inaccurate, the general consensus is that there is no bad blood between these people. Jason has yet to specify who would profit from this, but since the backlash, he's actually been posting videos on a regular basis, updating his followers on the situation and his position in assisting so far. Of course, Jason has donated money to the People's Fund of Maui, and he even teamed up with Dwayne Johnson to do public functions and collaborations to help raise awareness and scrape together as much money for the people of Maui as possible. Speaking of 
Dwayne Johnson. Number six, Dwayne Johnson. When it comes to this whole Maui fun situation, there is one person that keeps being left out of the conversation, and it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Now, Johnson is of course one of the most bankable men in Hollywood, starring in several franchises and jungle-based movies, but he's decided to partner with Oprah to create this People's Fund of Maui and donated $5 million of his own money to match Oprah's donation. Now, The Rock received a large amount of criticism, but not nearly as much as Oprah. The main reason being is that The Rock has a significantly smaller network. He's still only a millionaire, okay everybody? He's ju just as poor as the rest of us. Thousands of his followers have defended him rather than pass judgment. Let's face it, $5 million is still a ton of money and it's going to make a lot of people very happy. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of information regarding his position towards Oprah at this time. The comments on their posts have been turned off and the People's Fund of Maui has raised a ton of money since this whole backlash thing started. So at least there's something good coming out from all this negativity. Number five, Angelina Jolie. You would imagine that two people who consider themselves to be humanitarians would agree on something, but apparently that is not the case between Angelina Jolie and Oprah Winfrey. According to an insider close to Oprah, Angelina actually refused to help Oprah launch her Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for girls in South Africa. Take a sip every time I say Oprah. According to the source, Oprah reached out seeking celebrity sponsorship and public backing for the project. When she reached out to Angelina, she was met with a swift no thank you. Oprah assumed that Angelina, of all people, would jump at the chance to represent such an incredible cause, especially considering how much Angelina just loved Africa. But the no was a devastation and she would never ask for Angie's help again. A lot of people believe that the hate towards Oprah stems from her decision to publicly side with Jennifer Aniston after she split from Angie's ex Brad Pitt. Hey, to be fair, the split came a couple of weeks after, you know, I'm not gonna get into Brangelina, that's drama for a different story and a different list. Number four, Tom Hanks. Rumors have been circulating online that Tom Hanks may have received some inside information on the Maui wildfire situation that pertained to Oprah. Now, a ton of videos have been published online in the last few days claiming that Oprah orchestrated the Maui wildfires and hired a private team of firefighters to make it look more legit. Now, according to several media outlets, Tom was made aware of a secret plot because he's just so close to Oprah. The two have been known to share the occasional night out and some pasta. Now, well, it turns out that these were just rumors. In fact, they were actually created by an AI. Someone told a computer somewhere to write a story about Tom and Oprah, and the computer came up with Oprah sets Maui on fire, which is very dark. While it's a catching thumbnail and surely a fun little bit of information, the reality is that Tom has absolutely no idea what's going on. When asked about his position on the Maui fund, he has had nothing but positive things to say and is actually a little bit disappointed with the reaction from the world. When America's dad tells you he's disappointed, you gotta listen. That's harsh. Number three, Ludacris. Luda! <laughs> Luda! Sorry, just gotta get that out of my system, do it a couple of times. Ludacris appeared on Oprah in 2004 to promote the film Crash, and he claimed that Oprah ambushed him. With criticism about hip hop lyrics instead of actually talking about the critically acclaimed movie that he was there to plug, Luda has since claimed that Oprah edited the show to make herself seem more favorable to her audience members. He said during a separate interview that she had edited out a lot of his comments while keeping her own in. Now, of course, it's her show, but they were doing a show on racial discrimination, and she gave Luda a hard time as a rapper when he came on the show to be an actor. Luda revealed that his interview was extremely last minute. He didn't even know he was going to be on the show until about 24 hours beforehand. Following the interview on Oprah, she pulled him aside to a green room where he claims to have been berated by the talk show host. According to Oprah, having a rapper on her show made her feel like she was empowering them. He said it was like being at someone's house who just really did not want you there. At that point, you'd already been uncomfortable, but that was just a little cherry on top. Her main concern was, of course, his use of the N-word in lyrics, but he quickly pointed out the hypocrisy of having people like Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock on the show who were famous for using the slur in their sets. Oprah's shadiness was on full display following this interview with Luda. Luda! Luda! No, sorry, it's like a, twi it's like a twitch now. Number two, Kitty Kelly. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guest stars are made to sign, as well as a couple of other dark details. Now, the NDAs included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made his muffins. Over 500 staff members were 
forced to sign these documents and one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, even tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was stopped by the courts, still being tied to the agreement. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to just keep the show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. The book also contained information from a source close to Oprah, who said that in her four years with the show, she could tell that there was absolutely nothing there with her partner, Stedman. Oprah just kind of wanted to portray herself as a woman who loved her man on TV, but Stedman has always felt like this side character in her world, never really getting his moment to shine. The book revealed a million things, but the common theme was lies, lies, and more lies. Number one, herself. Oprah Winfrey is taking the top spot on the list of people exposing Oprah because she's been doing it since day one. Her talk show is all about bringing the most vulnerable people on to get views. She's brought violence victims, health experts, fake psychologists, and convicted felons onto her program, all for the sake of profit. As the years went by, her style was adapted by more and more studios, making shows like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz, which were both equally as controversial. Not to mention a few years ago when she wrote a book detailing her life and rise to the top, revealing some truly dark truths about her home life. She herself was considered to be a tyrant by her family, but it seems that whatever negative juju was happening in that house has permanently rubbed off on Oprah. Number 10, Cindy Crawford. Model and actress Cindy Crawford has called Oprah out over their 1986 interview that took place on her show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Crawford reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV Plus. Everyone has a plus now. The documentary spotlights the career of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course Cindy Crawford. In a clip from the documentary, Winfrey is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked her, Did she always have this body? This is unbelievable. Stand up, now that's what I call a body. She is visibly uncomfortable and sheepishly stands up before the studio audience cheered as she showed off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment, being told what to do by her superior. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type situation. At the time, this is just one of those weird things that Oprah asked her to do, but it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments in her early years in modeling. The most shocking thing for her was the fact that this was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. The woman known for her kindness and generosity made her feel like a puppet. Number 9, Seth MacFarlane. The creator of Family Guy and the Ted series is not a fan of Miss Oprah Winfrey. During the whole 2020 situation with the masks and the isolation, you know what I'm talking about, Seth decided to share some words of wisdom about Oprah Winfrey. He started by acknowledging that Oprah had done some pretty altruistic things with her career, but that she used her platform to amplify the voices of outlandish characters rather than legitimate scientists or medical professionals. The post included a link to the LA Times that discussed the misinformation from Dr. Phil and of course Dr. Oz. He was claiming that a ton of what was discussed on their shows was nothing more than misinformation and entertaining disasters. The Cash Me Outside girl, the purple guy who drank silver water like it was his job, and so many more that I can't actually talk about online. He called Oprah Winfrey out for starting as a legitimate show with the goal of educating and instead morphed into this misinformation platform. Number 8, Rose McGowan. A ton of A-listers out there will be on Oprah's side through thick and thin, just the way it is. However, Scream alumni and Me Too activist Rose McGowan is not one of those people. The former Charm star tweeted a photo from 2014 involving Oprah kissing the cheek of one of the most disgraced men in Hollywood history. Can't really say his name, but you know exactly who I'm talking about. The photo was taken from the 2014 Critics' Choice Movie Awards. She posted about on Twitter that she was glad to see the ugly truth about Oprah coming to light. And she said that she wished Oprah was real, but sadly she was not. According to Rose, she is as fake as they come, hashtag lizard. Winfrey claimed that she did not know what was going on back then and regretted being so close to such a terrible man. A terrible man that I really wish we could talk about, but nope, that's not happening. Number 6, Kid Rock. So Kid has never really been shy about his opinions on anything, especially when it comes to Oprah. A while back, Kid Rock was escorted out of his own steakhouse in Nashville for ranting about Oprah in an alcohol-fueled tirade. He told TMZ that his PR team actually tried to get him on Oprah at one point, and apparently Oprah's team wanted Kid to write down five reasons why he loved their show. He then said F that and threw away the offer. Over the following years and to this day, he has tweeted his opinions and feelings towards Oprah, with the big summary being that he just doesn't vibe with her, literally saying that he could not explain why. Well, maybe it was because he didn't believe that she was nice or charitable, but that he was certain that she was secretly a menace, and look where we are now. Number 6, Mel Gibson. There has been a ton of misinformation spread across the internet since this whole Oprah situation has gone down. For a while, people really 
believed that Jason Momoa and Tom Hanks had inside information on Oprah and that it needed to be shared with the world. But that was all a lie and neither of those people ever said a word about Oprah. Another celebrity brought into the mix for some reason is Mel Gibson, a man fueled by controversy. For the past few weeks, clips and comments have been making their way across the globe, alleging that Mel Gibson has the inside scoop on Oprah's secret agenda, ready to share it with the world. But that once again turned out not to be true. In fact, it was just someone who really loves using AI to try and make content. In fact, Mel has spoken out about claiming that he has never received inside info on Oprah and that he was fairly neutral on this so-called hate towards her. Number 5. Seal This man may be known for his vocal chops, but he should also be known for meme-making abilities. Just days after the Golden Globes, Seal posted a meme on Instagram consisting of several photos of Oprah Winfrey cozying up with a man who I will not be naming. He's a guy who produced half of Quentin Tarantino's movies and was a main character of the Me Too movement that happened back in 2017. He and Oprah were photographed spending time together and one photo even made it look like Oprah was pushing singer Rita Ora towards him. Seal captioned the image saying a bunch of stuff that I just cannot quote but the meme itself read, when you have been part of the problem for a decade but suddenly they all think you are the solution. Well I'm not sure how deep this feud goes but on the surface it seems like Seal has been trying to warn us that something is up for years. Number 4 Ice Cube Ice may have gotten his career thanks to his epic music chops both as a solo artist as well as during his time with the NWA. But these days you probably know him as the guy from Ride Along or 21 Jump Street. Ice Cube started acting in movies in 1991, debuting in the film Boys in the Hood as Doughboy. He continued to act over and over again, starring in movies like Friday, Anaconda and Are We There Yet? His dislike for Oprah comes from the fact that while he has starred in several films and has become more widely known for those films, she's never actually invited him onto the show. She's even asked his co-stars to appear rather than himself on multiple occasions. In 2006, Ice Cube expressed his frustrations, saying that his barbershop co-stars Cedric the Entertainer and Eve were all invited onto the show while he was left on the sidelines. He pointed out how crazy that is, the fact that she's had all these people with dark pasts and convictions, plus if he wasn't a rags to riches story then who was? We did get a little piece of that story in the film Straight Out of Compton in 2015, a film that received massive critical success and that was never mentioned on Oprah's show. Number 3 Jason Momoa Aquaman, the enemy of Don Torito and now the man speaking out on the Oprah Maui scandal, Jason Momoa is a gifted actor and by all accounts a gifted person too. Recently several news outlets have claimed that Jason is on the opposing side of the fund. According to these outlets Jason posted a video to Instagram where he addresses the fires and offers his own support to the victims. While never mentioning anyone by name, he mentions that some may use this as a way to exploit or make profit but that is not his intentions. The clip went viral and as you can guess many outlets were interpreting everything that they could, with the big headlines being Jason Momoa calls out Oprah for wildfires. While not completely inaccurate, the general consensus is that there is no bad blood between these people. Jason has yet to specify who would actually be profiting from this, but since the backlash he has been posting videos on a regular basis updating his followers on the situation, and also his position in assisting with things so far. Of course Jason has donated money to the People's Fund and has also teamed up with Dwayne Johnson to do public functions and collaborations to raise awareness and scrape together as much money for the people of Maui as possible. Number 2 Ludacris Ludacris appeared on Oprah in 2004 to promote the film Crash. He claimed that Oprah ambushed him with criticism about hip hop lyrics instead of talking about the critically acclaimed movie that he was there to plug. Ludacris has since claimed that Oprah edited the show to make herself seem more favourable to audience members. He said that during a separate interview that she had edited out a lot of his comments while keeping her own in. Of course it is her show but they were doing a show on racial discrimination and she gave Ludacris a hard time as a rapper when he came on her show as an actor. He then revealed that his interview was extremely last minute not knowing if it was a real thing roughly 24 hours before. Following the interview on Oprah she pulled him aside to a green room where he claims to have been berated by her. According to Oprah having a rapper on her show made her feel like she was empowering them. He said that it was like being at someone's house who really doesn't want you there and at that point he had already been very uncomfortable but that was a little cherry on top. Her main concern was his use of the n-word in lyrics but he quickly pointed out the hypocrisy of having people like Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock on the show. These guys were also famous for using the slur in their sets. Oprah's shadiness was on full display following that interview from Ludacris. Number 1 Herself Oprah is taking the top spot on a list of people exposing Oprah because yes she has been doing it since day one. Her talk show is all about bringing the most vulnerable people onto her show to get views. She's brought in violence victims, health experts, fake
take psychologists and convicted felons onto her program all for the sake of profit. As the years went by, her style was adapted by more and more studios, creating shows like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz, both equally as controversial. Not to mention a few years ago when she wrote a book detailing her early life and rise to the top, revealing some truly dark truths about her home life. She herself was considered to be a tyrant by her family, but it seems that whatever negative Juju lived in that house, it really rubbed off on her. Number 10, an advocate for Maui. Oprah has been claiming to be many things since this Maui backlash thing has started. A good boss, a charitable woman, and an advocate for the island of Maui. By starting this fund and donating her spare millions, she's made her mark in the public as a woman who cares so much so that she's asking you to give her your money. Isn't that nice? As mentioned in previous videos, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have a vested stake on the island. Oprah's had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her. When the fire started raging, she started fundraising. Think about all of the things that have happened in the past few years. We all forgot about Australia being set on fire in 2020. A lot of Western Canada was on fire earlier this year, and some parts of Florida have been underwater for a long time, and they just kind of live with it. Yet Oprah has dedicated her time and money to helping out the area where she has a vacation home. Do with that what you will. Number nine, the NDAs. Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Marvel will literally track you down if you say anything about their movies to anyone. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions there were confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guests were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the guy who made his breakfast in the morning. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign these documents with one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, trying to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was eventually stopped by the courts, still being tied to the agreement. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to just keep show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. According to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everybody in Oprah's life, and she may have had this brand of sweetness and kindness, but that it was just not how she was. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, there was even a lawsuit filed against Oprah and her company from a training performance center that was claiming that they were fired for violating the terms of her agreement, but all they did was just advertise that they were doing stuff for her show, so I'm not sure what's wrong there. Number eight, Diva. On air, Oprah is portrayed as this wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her stepmother, there's actually this unknown side to Oprah, hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah is one of the most controlling people that you're ever gonna meet. She claims that Oprah does not allow herself and her husband to stay at Oprah's home whenever they try to visit, which means that they have to stay in hotels with money out of their own pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was very quick to anger when it came to her staff especially, with a lot of people being fired over the years left and right for the littlest thing. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows Oprah to stay at her home when she visits, which she just complains about the entire time. The first time she ever stayed there, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets weren't a thousand threads and that her bath towel wasn't big enough, but that's fair. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything she wants, and what, and what she wants to do is make her family feel like a burden to the world. Number seven, controversial beliefs. Oprah has had plenty of controversial people onto her show from so-called medical experts to psychologists to celebrities. Whatever's good for TV, it's good for Oprah. One particular incident that caused a ton of backlash for Oprah was when she did an interview with Suzanne Summers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets on how she was able to look so young. According to Summers, this treatment that she does on a regular basis would help people. She claimed that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone into the other arm. Um, progesterone is just a fancy way of saying steroids. She also claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stirred the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and self-help author. But surprise, surprise, doctor she was not. Medical experts started bashing Oprah, claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy was actually the cause of several diseases and illnesses, you know, like cancer. Despite Suzanne's claims that her specially made non-FDA approved bioidenticals were natural and safe, they were actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you could buy from a pharmacy. The little label smacked on the front. Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that these methods were useful, even claiming to have used the methods to make herself feel incredible. So Oprah would rather risk her audience getting cancer than telling them the truth. Solid. Number six, 
the free cars. Who could forget Oprah's famous words? You get a car, you get a car, everybody got a car. The moment was historical on her series and was parodied time and time again and it still does to this day. However, what a lot of people do not know is that it wasn't as simple as here's some car keys, go have fun. That would be insane. No, when someone gives you anything on television, especially if it's free, there's a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they'd have to pay over $7,000 in taxes first. While Oprah Studio would cover the sales tax and registration for the cars, their audience members were given a choice to either pay seven grand and take the car or just simply keep that cash instead. The famous moment she shouted this on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience members, received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new cars. Everything has a catch though, even now. For someone who was known for being charitable and generous, the word free really does mean something different to Oprah. Number five, the fabricated memoirs. This is a time when Oprah kind of ruined someone's life when she brought them onto her show. Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment from her talk show that turned any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September 2005, Winfrey picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Frett about his years long struggle with substance control issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best selling nonfiction book of that year, and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called gut wrenching. However, the following year, a news outlet ran a very expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells a story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. Well, he was never on that train and he didn't have anything to do with that situation. He just wrote about it and was like, it was there. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she she felt duped and betrayed, which was a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. When she asked James why he felt the need to lie to herself and her readers, he tried everything, making every excuse he could think of, and he claimed that he altered a lot of details, but that the overall plot was real. While the studio audience responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps, and groans, and Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience, because that wasn't her intention. But the damage was already done, and this dude's career as a writer is non-existent. Number Four, Lance Armstrong. Seven time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong has gone down in history as a man who's unable to ride a bike without chemical training wheels. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey in 2013, Lance was brought on to discuss the allegations floating around regarding his status as a Tour de France winner. Several sources claimed that Lance had to take performance enhancing substances to win each and every race, as well as a type of transfusion involving the red life juice that flows inside all of us. Armstrong went on air and fessed up to every single thing that people were claiming claiming he had done, however he did deny the notion that he was like a mastermind who would control his teammates and force them to join in his extracurricular activities. But amidst his admission of guilt, say that ten times fast, there was a moment where he tried to pin the situation on his battle with cancer. He wraps it up by saying that he should have tried harder to cancel the culture rather than to create a problem. Well, unfortunately for him, he was stripped of all seven Tour de France titles and has since lived in exile among the cycling community. Number three, where's the beef? In spring of 19. 1996. The United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease, uh, since I can't pronounce that last word. According to the FDA, the disease destroys cows' central nervous system, and if humans eat the infected meat, you get zombies that can't. Um, no, you can contract a deadly variant called Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, probably named after the first dude who got the disease. During the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey show booked Howard Lyman. The former cattle rancher had adopted a vegetarian lifestyle and he went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Co-Science Animal Welfare Campaign and he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cows to America. He pointed out that feeding the remains of mad cow to infected cattle or other animals could have facilitated the spread and that a lot of that was happening in the US right then and there. Oprah was stunned and vowed that she would never eat another burger ever again. Well it turns out her influence and her millions of viewers were so large that only a few hours after the episode aired and she declared that she wasn't eating hamburgers ever again. The price of beef stock plummeted, staying at an all-time low for two months. In fact, one Texas rancher lost an estimated $6.7 million and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about beef. After a six-week trial, she won, leaving one dude with no farm and out hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. Number two, trespasser. So, 
There is a video circulating the internet that a lot of people are interpreting as a direct message to Oprah Winfrey. Jason Momoa released a video on his Instagram a few weeks ago urging tourists not to come to Maui as the place was on fire and you know, they didn't need anybody's help. He claimed that he appreciated anyone sharing love for the people of Maui and continued to say that there was someone trying to like scam people out of money that was pretending to be him online. After sharing links to several sites that were directly linked to putting money into the pockets of the people of Maui, fans decided to focus on the bit about people staying away. Now, at the same time that this was happening, Oprah and The Rock had announced the People's Fund of Maui, and the thing was that that caused a lot of backlash for Oprah. And in Jason's video, he does not include a link to the charity and doesn't even acknowledge its existence. He has since spoken about the charity, but has never actually said the names Oprah or Dwayne out loud. People are just putting two and two together, though, and the internet has decided that Jason Momoa has called Oprah Winfrey a trespasser. Number one, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata or an unwelcome person in Oprah's life after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turns out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub. Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading to a hilariously adorable moment where Oprah asked why Whoopi was mad at her, to which Whoopi was like, well, I'm not mad at you, I thought you were mad at me, what's going on here? They mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and figured the whole thing out and settled the dispute. Number 10, an advocate for Maui. Oprah has been claiming to be many things since the Maui backlash has begun. A good boss, a charitable woman, and an advocate for the island of Maui. By starting this fund and donating her spare millions, she has made her mark in the public as a woman who cares so much that she is asking you to give her your money. Isn't that sweet? The main reason people believe that Jason has not spoken on Oprah is because he knows that she is being a phony. As mentioned in a few previous videos, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have a vested stake on the island. Oprah has had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her. When the fire started raging, she started fundraising. Think about all of the things that have happened in the past few years. We all forgot about this, but Australia was on fire in 2020. Uh, let's see, Western Canada was on fire earlier this year. Heck, some parts of Florida have been underwater for the past few weeks. Yet Oprah has dedicated her time and money to helping out the area where she has a vacation home. Number nine, the multiple snubs. Jason is of course a gifted actor, having his mainstream career launched when he started in Game of Thrones as Khal Drago and cemented it when he portrayed Aquaman in Justice League. Now, Despite his several major screen roles and his work with various foundations and charities, Oprah has never invited him onto her show once. Jason has never outright complained about being snubbed by Oprah, but considering the person that he is with other talk show hosts, she was silly not to bring him on. He has a great story to tell and he is a joy, according to people like Jimmy Fallon and James Corden. As the years have gone by, Oprah's show was canceled and she now oversees a ton of shows that are similar to hers just from a production standpoint rather than being on screen. Jason has not been invited to those shows either, but I'm not sure what he would have to contribute to Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz. Number eight, trespasser. There is a video circulating the internet that many people are interpreting as a direct message to Oprah Winfrey. Jason released a video on his Instagram a few weeks ago urging tourists not to come to Maui as the place was on fire and they did not need anybody's help. He claimed that he appreciated anyone sharing love for the people of Maui and continued to say that there was someone trying to actually scam people out of money pretending to be him online. After sharing links to several sites that were directly linked to putting money into the pockets of the people of Maui, fans decided to focus on the bit about people staying away rather than that. At the same time that this was happening, Oprah and The Rock had announced the People's Fund of Maui, which was the thing that caused all of this backlash in the first place. In Jason's video, he does not include a link to the charity, and he does not even acknowledge its existence. He's since spoken out about the charity, but has never said the names Oprah or Dwayne Johnson aloud. People are just putting two and two together, and the internet has decided that Jason Momoa has called out Oprah Winfrey for being an absolute 
trespasser. Number seven, the lies online. Ever since the Maui situation has broken, content creators have done everything that they can to get views and share different sides of the Oprah story. One of those people is said to be Jason Momoa. Someone somewhere created a story about Jason Momoa calling Oprah Winfrey evil. A video claiming that she was to blame for Maui, that she was not to be trusted, you know, all that jazz. Someone said that was real. However, that's not true. The video in question was actually edited out of context and shared with the entire world. Beneath the edit was the caption, Jason calls out Oprah over Maui. Now because of the way that this was edited and that little sentence burrowing into your mind, the second you click the video, it suddenly became the truth. People were so confident that Jason was pointing the finger, but in reality, like I've mentioned before, he actually has not mentioned Oprah or The Rock by name. The evil that he was referring to was the hackers on Instagram who were trying to catfish as him and asking people for money. Now I know the title of this video is Jason Momoa exposed Oprah, and up to this point, these have been legitimate examples, but that's that's really all I have for specific Jason versus Oprah stuff. So for the rest of this video, why don't we just talk about the woman that you came here to learn about for a moment, Oprah Winfrey. If you made it this far, thanks for sticking around. Let's get into some dark Oprah secrets that were exposed. Number six, her free cars. Who could forget Oprah's famous words? You get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. She didn't say it like that, but I gotta put a little shimmy in it. The moment was historical on her series and was parodied time and time again, and it still does get parodied today. What many people don't know is that it wasn't as simple as here are your keys, you know, have fun. When someone gives out anything on television, there is always a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they'd have to pay her $7,000 in taxes first. While Oprah's studio would of course cover the sales tax and the registration for each car, the audience members were given a choice. They either could pay the seven grand and take the car that they needed out of the studio, or they could just simply take cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience, received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new vehicles, but everything has a catch even now. For someone who was known for being such a charitable and generous woman, the word free really does mean something different to Oprah. Number five, the NDAs. Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Marvel will literally hire someone to take you out if you even think about dropping a single line to the public. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guests were made to sign. Now this included everybody from guests like Tom Cruise to the person who made Tom's muffins. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign this document, and one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, actually tried to write a book about her time working with Oprah. But she was stopped by the courts, still being tied to the agreement that she had signed. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to keep just the show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets were locked in a vault. According to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everyone in Oprah's life. She may have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but in reality, that is apparently not even close. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after signing the paperwork, and in 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company, claiming that the company Unicus Performance Training had violated the terms of her agreement, specifically involving advertising with her name. Oh, does someone give you a free ad? That's too bad. Number four, Diva. On air, Oprah is portrayed as this wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her stepmother and a ton of other people, there is an unknown side to Oprah, hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah's stepmother, Oprah is one of the most controlling people that you're ever going to meet. She claims that Oprah will not allow them to stay at her house whenever they try to visit, forcing them to stay in hotels with money out of their own pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger when it came to her staff, with several people being fired left and right over the years just because. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows Oprah to stay at her house when she visits, something that Oprah apparently complains about the moment she steps through the door. The first time she ever stayed over, Oprah allowed allegedly complained that her bed sheets weren't a thousand threads and that her bath towels weren't big enough. I can forgive that last one. Giant bath towels are legendary. If you don't have one, I suggest you get one. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything that she wants and apparently what she wanted to do was make her family feel like they were a burden. Number three, she's a wild child. Several books have been published about Oprah over the years. Some of them were from her and some of them were not. In her own book that she wrote, she revealed that growing up she was far from an easy kid to handle. When she was young, she was sent to live with her father Vernon after Oprah was caught stealing from her mom's purse. And despite being an on-screen persona known for charity and kindness, she was actually a menace throughout most of her life, according to her family. As I mentioned previously, Oprah's stepmother is not allowed to stay at her house, and she 
is known to be very controlling. She even admitted to doing some pretty troubling things at a very young age, including staging an amnesia bout, breaking several things in her mom's house, and then calling the police so they could come investigate. According to Oprah's mother, she was uncontrollable, ungrateful, and after that stunt, maybe a little crazy. Number two, her buddy, Dr. Phil. Oprah is not just responsible for hopes and dreams being squashed live on her show, but she's also the creator of many talk show celebrities, namely health expert Dr. Roz and the so-called life coach Dr. Phil. Now, before Dr. Phil had his own show, Oprah had asked him and his courtroom consulting firm, which is what he did before, to help her with a trial. Before meeting Oprah, Phil had zero interest in being a television personality, but then Oprah was like, hey, you should do it, and she made him see the light. According to Phil, she helped helped him understand the power of the show and what they were truly made for. Now for Dr. Phil, he brings people onto his show who are struggling with really personal issues that just so happen to be great for television. Remember that Catch Me Outside girl? Dr. Phil made her rich and famous. Thanks man. But it's not just Phil that's had some controversial moments, but it's not just Phil that's had some controversial moments. Her other protege, Dr. Oz, has had some pretty rough moments. His show is centered around medicine and health, so he brings so-called, you know, experts on. We Week after week, my mom loved this show. Oprah was partnered with both of these people, meaning that whatever they made, she got a little bit of something for her trouble. Now, she doesn't like to advertise how much she really made from these programs, but considering how many episodes they have and how long the programs have run for, it's probably a lot. And at number one, herself. Now, Oprah is taking the top spot on the list of dark secrets exposed by because She's been doing it since day one, okay? She did it to herself. Her talk show is all about bringing the most vulnerable people on to get views. She's brought violence victims, health experts, fake psychologists, and convicted felons onto her program, all for the sake of views and profit. As the years went by, her style was adapted by more and more people, with Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz just being two prime examples, but they are both equally as controversial. Not to mention, a few years back, she wrote a book detailing her early life and rise to the top, revealing a ton of dark stuff that could occupy its own list. She herself was considered to be a tyrant by her family, but it seems that whatever negative juju lived in that house, it rubbed off on Oprah. Number 10, Fabricated Memoir. Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment for her talk show that turned any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September of 2005, Winfrey picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Frett about his years-long struggle with substance control issues. Now, A Million Little Pieces Pieces became the best-selling non-fiction book of the year, and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called gut-wrenching. However, the following year, a news outlet ran a very expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he had made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells the story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. Yeah, he was never on that train, nor did he have any involvement in that situation. That was just something he thought it was neat to put in his book. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed, a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. She asked why James felt the need to lie to herself and to her readers, and he tried everything, making every excuse that he could think of. He claimed that he altered a lot of the details, but that the overall plot was real. Yeah, that claim caused the studio audience to respond with a massive wave of of boos, gasps, and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience, as it was not really her intention, but the damage was already done. His career as a writer is non-existent. Number nine, Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan have appeared in the public eye more and more in the past few years. After leaving the duties of their royal family to live on their own, they decided to capitalize on their so-called fame by releasing a series of different medias, books, podcasts, documentaries, and in 2021, they sat down with Oprah Winfrey to air every single piece of dirty laundry that they had left in their hamper. Of course, the royal family does not appreciate their secrets being shared with the entire world, so not only was everyone blacklisted by them, but the interview kind of soiled their reputations as good people. According to fans of the Oprah Winfrey show, the interview made the couple look more villainous than it was intended. Following the interview, their public image was slightly tainted, and with more media coming out, it was just, it made the situation so much worse. Meghan got a podcast and couldn't come up with material for the first year. They made a documentary 
the people didn't like, so who knows what they'll get up to next. It certainly won't be anything good. Number eight, Lance Armstrong. Seven time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong has gone down in history as a man who is unable to ride a bike without chemical training wheels. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey in 2013, Lance was brought on to discuss the allegations floating around regarding his status as a Tour de France winner. Several sources claimed that Lance had to take performance enhancing substances to win all of his races, as well as a type of transfusion involving the red life juice that lives inside all of us. Armstrong went on air and fessed up to every single thing that they were claiming he had done. However, he did deny the notion that he was some kind of a mastermind who was controlling his teammates and forcing them to join in his extracurricular activities. But if it's his admission of guilt, say that 10 times fast, I can't even do it once, there was a moment where he tried to pin the situation on his battle with cancer. He wraps it up by saying he should have tried harder to cancel the culture rather than create more of a problem. He was stripped of all seven Tour de France titles and has since lived in exile among the cycling world. Number seven, where's the beef? In spring of 1996, the United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalitis or mad cow disease because I'm, I can't pronounce that. According to the FDA, the disease destroys cow's central nervous systems and if humans eat the infected meat, we get zombies. No, but they can contract a deadly variant called Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease. During the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey show booked Howard Lyman. The former cattle rancher had adopted a vegetarian lifestyle and went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Co-Science Animal Welfare campaign. And he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cow disease to Americans. He pointed out that feeding the remains of a cow to an infected cattle or other animals could facilitate the spread and that such practices were common in the United States. Oprah was stunned and vowed that she would never eat a burger ever again. Her influence and her millions of viewers though were so large that only a few hours after this episode aired and she declared that she'd never eat a burger again, the price of beef stocks plummeted, staying at an all-time low for two months. One Texas rancher lost an estimated $6.7 million and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about beef. Well, after six weeks of the trial, she won, leaving one man with no farm and out thousands and thousands of dollars in legal fees. Number six, Tom Cruise. Despite this guy being in the Mission Impossible franchise, he has been in a lot of movies produced by himself. You didn't think Hollywood forgot about Oprah Winfrey's interview with him, did you? I certainly will never. Following the announcement that he was engaged to Katie Holmes in the early 2000s, Tom appeared on an episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show. That is surely the most chaotic moment in TV history. From the moment he steps on stage, things just start to go horribly wrong. He throws his arms up in the air, he rubs her like she's a genie and he's trying to get a lamp out. Seriously, I'm not sure what his thought there was, but he was nuts. Tom jumped on her couch, he grabbed her hands over and over again. She couldn't even get the questions that she had out. Eventually, Oprah was like, I don't care anymore, just bring this lady out. And the cameras followed him around as he ran through the studio trying to find her. Looks like a nature guy running through a jungle with his camera crew. The moment cemented Tom as a man with many hidden personalities, and while it has not affected his work as an actor per se, ever since that day, whenever he's brought in for press or any kind of interviews, all entrances and exits must be locked. Again, this guy may be in movies still, but it's rarely anything new or exciting. Number five, Jay Leno. In 2004, NBC announced that the late night host Conan O'Brien would be taking over as the full-time host of The Tonight Show, replacing Jay Leno in five years. When those five years passed and it was time to upgrade, NBC did not want to lose Leno to another network, so they gave him his own talk show in a prime time spot. The Jay Leno Show failed to capture an audience and The Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien was not an instant rating smash. So, by the early 2010s, NBC had dismissed Conan and threw Jay back into the fold. Jay became public enemy number one. People thought that he was the reason Conan lost his job. Oprah invited Leno onto the show to share his side of the story and he didn't do much to save face. He wrote the entire thing off as dramatic and a mess and then decided to play the victim card, claiming that he felt sucker punched by the backlash. He also admitted that when he announced his eventual resignation that he was 100% lying to everybody's face. He wasn't getting out of there anytime soon. He then argued very passive aggressively that NBC was right to reinstall him because under Conan's poor ratings, it marked, in his words, the first time in 60 years of The Tonight Show that it would have lost money. A poll was conducted on Oprah's website, and the consensus was that 96% of the audience hated Leno and missed Conan. Eventually, Jay was replaced by Jimmy Fallon, and Conan O'Brien's show, Conan, was a massive success. Number four, Monique. The beef between comedian and act Monique in 
Oprah Winfrey goes back to 2010. Monique had just won an Oscar for her performance in Precious in 2009. And leading up to the film's premiere, Oprah interviewed Monique's brother Gerald, who Monique claimed to have been physical towards her growing up in a truly dark way. In a since deleted Periscope video, Monique claimed that she gave Winfrey her blessing to do the interview, but was shocked and disgusted when her parents were in the audience. In the years that followed, Monique eventually forgave Oprah for creating such an uncomfortable moment for herself and her family. But following the show, Monique and her family did not make up. Exposing that kind of personal family information on TV destroyed the chances of anything, any kind of relationship ever materializing. Number three, Mackenzie Phillips. When people see the words tell all interview on their screens, there is an instant sense of mystery and we get hooked, especially when that celebrity is known for their outlandish behavior and highly documented substance use. Viewers of the Oprah Winfrey show were probably still pretty unprepared for what was about to happen though. The former One Day at a Time star Mackenzie Phillips appeared on her show in 2009 to promote and discuss her soon to be released tell all book High on Arrival. She read aloud a passage describing how after waking up from a substance induced blackout she discovered her father John was physically forcing himself onto her. When Mackenzie confronted him he denied everything but she continued and claimed that the relationship did eventually become consensual and that's when the audience turned. Mackenzie came on a highly publicized television program and aired her extremely dirty laundry to the world. The world, or should I say her family, responded to the claims and they were actually shocked and felt that these were completely untrue. Ever since that interview, her career and her relationship with her family and well, everybody has been dark and rocky. Number two, Sarah Ferguson. The royal couple are still something to behold, something that a lot of people in the world wish to hear about as often as possible. Back in the day, instead of Harry and Meghan, they had Sarah and Prince Andrew. Now much like how Meghan and Harry came on Oprah's show to discuss their side of their story, Sarah did the same in the 1990s. Ferguson sat down with Oprah to discuss her time in the palace after 10 years of marriage to Andrew ended in divorce. According to Ferguson, living in the palace was anything but luxury. She told Oprah that the royal family life was not a fairy tale, but more of a dreadful existence adhering to nitpicked rules. For instance, the windows at the palace could only be opened a certain amount so that they all look in line. And she was reportedly berated one day when she opened a window and was told that it was the wrong thing to do. She also detailed the treatment that she had been receiving from the British media who were and still are extremely invasive. She came back on the show a few times to basically go over the aftermath of the previous interview. Turns out the royal family doesn't like it when you trash it on TV. Eh, who knew? And at number one, Terry McMillan. One thing that Oprah loves to do is bring couples with issues onto her show to make a few bucks off of their problems. Best-selling author Terry McMillan based her novel How Stella Got Her Groove Back on her own life. Like the book's main character, she was a successful divorced middle-aged woman who found love again with a man two decades younger than her. According to Oprah's website, in 1995, Macmillan took a trip to Jamaica and fell in love with a 20-year-old named Jonathan Plummer. Before long, they moved in together and got married, but they eventually split in 2005 when Plummer revealed that he was gay. Revealing the truth to the world resulted in a tabloid frenzy, and the couple started bad-mouthing each other to the press, with Plummer successfully suing his former wife for spousal support. The argument between these two came to a head thanks to Oprah Winfrey, hosting both of them on her show in 2005, she allowed them to confront each other live on stage and let out all of their pain and frustration. Shortly after, Macmillan sued Plummer for $40 million, citing emotional distress and destruction of reputation. The altercation on her show left Macmillan feeling like she needed to make a statement, and she did. In doing so, she ruined the reputation of herself and her ex. And those are the interviews that destroyed lives thanks to Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey. Who would have guessed that this woman, famous for handing out cars on her talk show, is being cancelled by the entire world? And why, you may ask? Well, Oprah made a career-ending mistake when herself and Dwayne Johnson broke the one rule of being a billionaire. Don't ask poor people for their money. A few weeks ago, Oprah and The Rock announced that they would be starting a relief fund for the victims of the Maui wildfires. The People's Fund of Maui was given a solid $10 million to get off the ground. $10 million donated by Oprah and Dwayne combined. So why is it just Oprah that's getting so much hate? Well, it's because she has a net worth of roughly uh, $2.8 billion. 
That is Billion with a B. The world is collectively furious at Oprah for having the audacity to ask working class citizens for charity when most people can barely afford to put food on their tables. The Rock and Oprah donated $5 million each to give the fund a head start. Well, guess what? $5 million to Oprah is like 500 to us. Just chump change. Oprah has responded to the backlash online and is very confused as to where all this hate is coming from. Oprah has been known for a long time as being a pretty charitable woman who could forget Oprah's famous, you get a car, you get a car, everyone gets a car moment. The moment was historical on her series and it was parodied time and time again and it still does to this day. However, what a lot of people don't know is that that wasn't really the case. It wasn't as simple as here are your keys, have fun. Whenever someone gives out anything, especially on television, there's always a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they actually wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would have to pay over $7,000 first in taxes. While Oprah's studio would of course cover like the sales tax and the registration for each car, the audience members were given a choice to either pay the $7,000 and take the car or simply take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience, received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new cars. Everything has a catch though, even now. For someone who's known for being charitable and generous, the word free clearly means something else to Oprah. Now, the world is understandably frustrated. Imagine someone with a physical gold bar around their neck asking you for spare change on the street. Um, hey, what's that thing around your neck? It's shiny, it makes me feel bad about myself. Use that. Oprah has always been a little bit twisted. Let's not forget just what her show really is. Oprah used to bring the most vulnerable people that she could find onto the show to share their stories. While some were just actors, gurus, or people sharing positive tragedies, there were also just so many people who would just cry on her show. And let's not forget the other careers that this woman is responsible for creating, especially programs with some of her friends. Oprah is not just responsible for many hopes and dreams being squashed live on air, she's actually also the creator of a couple of talk show celebrities, namely health expert Dr. Oz, and of course the so-called life coach, Dr. Phil. Before Dr. Phil had his own show, Oprah actually asked him and his courtroom consulting firm to help with a trial. Before meeting Oprah, Phil apparently had zero interest in being a television personality, but eh, Oprah made him see the light, so to speak. According to Phil, she helped him understand the power of these shows and what they were truly made for. For Phil, he brings people onto his show who are struggling with personal issues that just so happen to be good for TV. Remember the Catch Me Outside girl? Dr. Phil made her rich and famous. Good job, buddy. But it's not just Phil that's had some controversial moments. Her other protege, Dr. Oz, has had some pretty rough moments as well. His show is centered around medicine and health, which is never controversial, right? Bringing so-called experts on every week. My mother absolutely loved this guy and she will not stop hammering in his tactics. Oprah was partnered with both of these people, meaning that whatever their shows made, she got a little bit of something for her trouble. Now, she doesn't like to advertise how much she actually made from these programs, but considering how many episodes there have been and how long the programs have run for, it's probably a lot. Like, think about all of the money that this woman has made off of the tragedies of others. This situation with Maui is just another one of the many so-called foundations and charities that she's behind. Now, while some have been extremely beneficial to the world, especially the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa, others are just clear cash grabs and bragging right makers like this one. If Oprah really wanted to make a difference and truly help the people of Maui, she would have donated $10 million by herself and gotten Dwayne to match it or something. But let's not forget about the other person involved in the situation, Dwayne Johnson, AKA The Rock. He's one of the busiest and most bankable men in Hollywood. This man has appeared in everything and he even turned himself into a superhero when he played Black Adam. His power and influence knows no bounds. Now, of these two, we understand why Dwayne would feel that this is an important cause because he has family on the island and spent a ton of time in Maui growing up. Now, Oprah is just Oprah. She actually purchased a property in Maui not long before the fires broke out. Many believe that the only reason that she even cares about the situation is because she owns land there. If she was still living in the States, she would have continued to live her life without a care in the world. The proof that they believe Maui is home is comparing their efforts to that of Dolly Parton. 
who organized a foundation to assist people in Tennessee after a wildfire destroyed thousands of homes. I've actually stayed in Gatlinburg, where she's from, many times. It is a beautiful town, but from what I understand, the resort that I used to stay at with my family has practically been burned down to the ground. Dolly did an incredible job and continues to do humanitarian work across the US and around the world to this day. However, when Oprah asked people to do it, it just felt weird. Like someone who was not from this place was taking a vested interest in the situation. Before this Maui situation though, Oprah was a well-respected TV host. But as it turns out, there might have been some dark truths behind the production of her show that should have been red flag after red flag. Case in point, the confidentiality agreements. Now, confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Heck, Marvel will literally have someone take you out if you even think about sharing their secrets. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guest stars were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made his muffins. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign this document, but one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was apparently stopped by the courts, still being tied to this agreement that she had signed, even though she didn't really work for the show anymore. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to keep just the show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. According to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everyone in Oprah's life. She may have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but apparently that's just not how she is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket, so to speak, after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company. Unicus Performance Training claimed that they were fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving advertisement with her name or the website of the show. But it's not only the former staff that are made to keep silent. Oprah Oprah's own family has spoken out about her past behavior since the news of this scandal broke a few weeks ago. On air, Oprah is portrayed as this wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her stepmother, there is an unknown side to Oprah hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah is one of the most controlling people you will ever meet. She claims that Oprah would not allow them to stay at her house when they tried to visit, forcing her own parents to stay in hotels with money out of their pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger, especially when it came to her staff, with several people being fired left and right over the years for the littlest things. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara actually lets Oprah stay at her home when she visits, which is something that Oprah apparently just hates. The first time she ever stayed over, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets were not a thousand threads and that her bath towels weren't big enough. Well, that last one's a little excusable, okay? If you ever used a giant bath towel, I'm never going back. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything she wants and what she wants is to make her family feel like a burden. It turns out that her wild child behavior though started a long time ago, well before she was a TV host, way back when she was just a little one. Several books have been published about Oprah over the years, some from her and some that are not. In her own book that she wrote, Oprah revealed that growing up she was far from an easy kid to handle. When she was young, she was sent to live with her father Vernon after she was caught stealing from her mother's purse. Despite being an on-screen persona known for charity and kindness, she was actually a menace throughout most of her life, according to family members at least. As I've mentioned previously, Oprah's stepmother is not allowed to stay at her house and she is known to be pretty controlling. She admitted to doing some pretty troubling things at a very young age, including staging an amnesia bout where she broke several things in her mother's house and then called the police. According to Oprah's mother, she was uncontrollable, ungrateful, and after robbing her maybe a little bit crazy. As the situation continues, more and more is surely going to come out of the situation with Oprah. While the current news is that the fund is active, she is inactive and refuses to discuss the backlash with anyone. She recently made a television appearance giving one of her most honest interviews of all time, discussing things like her use of Ozempic, obesity in general, and the shame that surrounds weight loss supplements. That's nice, but where's the money talk? Number 10, Cindy Crawford. Model and actress Cindy Crawford has called Oprah out over their 1986 interview that took place on her show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Crawford reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV Plus. Everyone has a plus now. The documentary spotlights the career of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course, Cindy Crawford. In a clip from the documentary, Winfrey is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked, hey, did she always have this body? <laughs> this is unbelievable, stand up. Now that's what I call a body. She's visibly just uncomfortable 
visible and sheepishly stands up before the studio audience cheers as she shows off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment, being told what to do by a superior. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type thing. At the time, this was just some weird thing that Oprah asked her to do, but it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments of her early years in modeling. The most shocking thing for her was the fact that this was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. The woman known for kindness and generosity and cars made her feel like a puppet. Number 9. Jason Momoa, Aquaman, the enemy of Dom Toretto, and now a man speaking out on Oprah Winfrey and Maui. Jason Momoa is a gifted actor and by all accounts he is a gifted person as well. Recently several news outlets have claimed that Jason is on the opposing side of this whole Maui fun thing. If you don't know what that's about, go check out some of our previous videos about Oprah Winfrey where we do it in you know deep dive. According to these outlets, Jason posted a video to Instagram in which he addresses the fires and offers his own support to the victims while never actually mentioning anyone by name. He does mention that some may use this as a way to exploit or make profit, but that was not his intentions. The clip went viral and as you can guess, outlets were interpreting everything that they could out of it, with the biggest headline being Jason Momoa calls out Oprah for wildfires. While not completely inaccurate, the general consensus is that there is actually no bad you know, juju between these people. Jason has yet to specify who would profit from this, but since the backlash, he's been posting videos on a regular basis, updating people on the situation, and his position in assisting so far. Of course, he's already donated lots of money to the island and has teamed up with Dwayne Johnson to do public functions and collaborations and raise awareness, so that's great considering where it spawned from. Number eight, Dwayne Johnson. Now, when it comes to the whole Maui fun situation, there is one person who is usually left out of the conversation, and that is Dwayne Johnson. Johnson is, of course, one of the most bankable men in Hollywood, starring in like a million franchises, mostly in the jungle. He decided to partner with Oprah Winfrey to create the People Fund of Maui, donated $5 million of his own money to match Oprah's donation. The Rock received a large amount of criticism, but not nearly as much as Oprah did. The main reason being is that The Rock actually has a significantly smaller net worth, and the money that he donated was actually his own money. He's still only a millionaire, everyone. He's just as poor as the rest of us. Thousands of his followers have defended him rather than passing judgment because, hey, $5 million is a ton of money and it's gonna make a lot of people's lives that much easier. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of information regarding his position towards Oprah, but the comments on their posts have been turned off and the People's Fund of Maui has raised a lot of money since, so at least something good's coming from all the negativity. Number seven, Tom Hanks. Rumors have been circulating online that Tom Hanks may have received some inside information about the Maui wildfires that pertain to Oprah Winfrey. Now, a ton of videos have been published online in the last like couple months claiming that Oprah orchestrated the Maui wildfires and hired a private team of firefighters to make it look more real. According to several media outlets, Tom was made aware of a secret plot because, you know, he's so close to Oprah. The two have been known to share the occasional night out and some pasta. Well, it turns out that these were in fact rumors created by an AI. Someone told a computer to write a story about Tom Hanks and Oprah, and it came up with Oprah sets Maui on fire. So that should tell you how good AI is. While a catching thumbnail and surely a fun bit of information, the reality is that Tom has no idea what's going on. When asked about his position on the Maui fund, he had nothing but positive things to say and is actually a little disappointed with the reaction from the world. When America's dad tells you he's disappointed in you, that that's just an extra level of hurt. Number six, Oprah Winfrey herself. Oprah is taking one of the bigger spots on this list because she has been trying to warn us about herself since day one. Her talk show is all about bringing the most vulnerable people on and getting views. She's brought violence victims, health experts, fake psychologists, and even convicted felons onto her program, all for the sake of making a few bucks. As the years went by, her style was adapted by more and more studios, creating shows like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz, who were both equally as controversial. Not to mention a few years ago when she wrote a book detailing her life and rise to the top, she revealed some truly dark things about her home life. Again, covered that in detail in a different video. She herself was considered to be a tyrant by her family, but it seems that whatever negative juju was in that house rubbed off on her forever. Now, there are actually a pretty limited number of celebrities who warned us about Oprah, because overall, most stories are fake that are out there in the world. So let's talk about some lives that have been destroyed by Oprah Winfrey when they actually did go on her show for real. Number five, a fabricated memoir. Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment from her talk show that turned any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September of 2005, she picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James 
fret about his years long struggle with substance control issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best selling non fiction book of the year and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called gut wrenching. However, the following year a news outlet ran a very expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells the story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. He was never on that train nor did he have any involvement with that situation. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed and that feeling was shared by her audience and millions of people who read that book. She asked why James felt the need to lie to herself and the readers and he tried everything making every excuse that he could think of. He claimed that he altered a lot of the details but that the overall plot was real. The studio audience responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience as it was not her intention but the damage was already done and his career as a writer is currently non-existent. Number 4 Harry and Meghan Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have appeared in the public eye more and more in the past few years. After leaving the duties of their royal family to live on their own, they decided to capitalize on their so called fame by releasing a series of different medias, books, podcasts, documentaries, and in 2021 they sat down with Oprah Winfrey to air out every piece of dirty laundry that was left in their hamper. Of course, the royal family does not appreciate these secrets being shared with, you know, the world. So not only was Harry blacklisted by them, but the interview kind of soiled the royals' reputation as good people. According to fans of Oprah, the interview made the couple look more villainous than they surely intended. Following the interview, their public image was slightly tainted, and with more media coming out, it just made the situation even worse. Megan got a podcast and couldn't keep up with material for the first year. They made a documentary that people just don't like, so who knows what they'll get up to next. It certainly will not be anything good. Number 3 Lance Armstrong Seven time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong has gone down in history as a man who is unable to ride a bike without using some chemical training wheels. In an interview with Oprah from 2013, Lance was brought on to discuss the allegations floating around regarding his status as a Tour de France winner. Several sources claimed that Lance had to take performance enhancing substances to win each race, as well as a type of transfusion involving the red life juice that flows inside of all of us. Armstrong went on air and fessed up to every single thing that had been claimed about him, except he did deny the notion that he was some kind of a mastermind who was controlling his teammates and forcing them to join in his extracurricular activities. But amidst his omission of guilt, say that 10 times fast, there was a moment where he tried to pin the situation on his battle with cancer. He wraps it up by saying that he should have tried harder to cancel the culture rather than create more of a problem. He was stripped of all seven Tour de France titles and has since lived in exile among the cycling world and honestly just the world in general. Number two, Where's the beef? In spring 1996, the United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease, since I can't pronounce that last word properly. According to the FDA, the disease destroys cow's central nervous systems, and if humans eat the infected meat, you get zombies! No, but they can contract a deadly variant called Kritzfeld Jacob disease. During the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey show booked Howard Lyman. The former cattle rancher had adopted a vegetarian lifestyle and went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Co-Science Animal Welfare Campaign, and he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cows to America. He pointed out that feeding the remains of mad cow to infected cattle or other animals could have facilitated the spread and that such practices were actually pretty common in the US. Oprah was stunned and vowed that she would never eat a burger ever again. It turns out her influence and her millions of viewers were so large that only a few hours after the episode aired and she declared to never eat a hamburger again, the price of beef plummeted, staying at an all time low. Like anyone who had stocks in the beef industry just not good. One Texas rancher lost an estimated $6.7 million and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about American beef. After a six week trial, she won, leaving someone with no farm and out thousands of extra dollars in legal fees. And at number one, Tom Cruise. Despite this man being in Mission Impossible, he has been in a lot of movies produced by Tom Cruise. You didn't think Hollywood forgot about the Oprah show, did ya? 
Okay, then, following the announcement that he was engaged to Katie Holmes in the early 2000s, Tom appeared on an episode of The Oprah Winfrey Show that has gone down in history as one of the most chaotic TV moments of all time. From the moment he steps on stage, things are just going wrong. He throws his arms out in the air, he rubs Oprah's shoulder like she's a genie or she's got a stain that just won't come out. Tom jumped on her couch, grabbed her hands, and she couldn't even get a question out. Eventually, Oprah was like, all right, whatever, just bring Katie Holmes out, and the cameras followed Tom as he ran around the studio trying to get her. Like he was the nature guy running through a jungle like Steve Irwin back in the day. The moment cemented Tom as a man with many hidden personalities, and while it has not affected his work as an actor, ever since that day, whenever he's brought in for press of any kind, all entrances and exits must be locked just to be safe. Number 10. We'll never marry Stedman. Oprah and her partner Stedman have been together for a long, long time, but have never actually gotten married. While Stedman has never explained why this is, Oprah shared her side of the story. According to Oprah, getting married would mean that she would not be able to, quote, have her own life, claiming that everything she's built on her own would be at risk, like he was some kind of a career parasite. The strangest part about her logic behind this is the fact that she said on air that she actually wanted Stedman to propose to her as soon as possible. Their relationship has survived a lot despite the years of rumors and speculation. However, a source close to Oprah said that in her four years with the show, she could tell that there was absolutely nothing there with this man. Oprah just wanted to portray herself as a woman who loved her husband, and he wasn't even her husband, so she was just someone who loved her guy. In reality, Stedman probably has a house separate to Oprah, but like one-fifth of the size. Number nine, she's a diva. On air, Oprah is portrayed as this wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her family, there is an unknown side to Oprah, hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah's stepmother, she is one of the most controlling people that you're ever going to meet in your entire life. She claims that Oprah would not allow them to stay at her house whenever they would try to visit, forcing them to stay in hotels with money out of their own pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger when it came to her staff, with several people being fired over the years, left and right. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows Oprah to stay at her house when she comes for visits, but apparently Oprah hates every second of that. From the first time she stayed till probably last week, Oprah just complains about her bed sheets that aren't a thousand threads and that her bath towels aren't big enough. But big bath towels are a luxury, so I get that one. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything that she wants, but apparently the only thing she wants to do is make her family feel bad. Number eight, her spiritual beliefs. I'm gonna start this entry by clarifying that I'm not making fun of your beliefs if you're spiritual. Please know this entry is not about you, it's about Oprah and just Oprah. In an interview with Harper Bazaar, Oprah mentioned her daily morning routine that starts at 8.30 with various spiritual exercises. After reading Gathered Truths, she opens an app called Bowl of Saki that delivers teachings of the Sufi, followed by some light meditation. The controversy here comes from Oprah inviting several self-fulfillment gurus onto her show and gushing about them over the years, and especially Guru Gary Zuka's preachings. Oprah herself claimed to have secret spiritual knowledge about tapping into personal courage and giving general spiritual advice. She stopped diving too deep into spirituality after the backlash from her fans and readers of her magazine. Number seven, Wild Child. Several books have been published about Oprah over the years. Some of them were from her, some of them were not. In her own book that she wrote herself, she revealed that growing up, she was far from this easy kid to handle. When she was young, she was sent to live with her father, Vernon, after Oprah was caught stealing from her mom. Despite being an on-screen persona known for charity and kindness, she was actually a menace throughout most of her life, according to her family. As I've mentioned on several lists before this, Oprah's stepmother, oh, and I also said it on this one. As I mentioned just previously on this list, Oprah's stepmother is not allowed to stay at her house, and she's known to be pretty controlling. She admitted to doing some pretty troubling things at a young age, including staging an amnesia bout, where she broke several things in her mom's house and called the police, pretending not to know what happened. Yeah, according to Oprah's mom, she was uncontrollable, ungrateful, and I'm pretty sure after that situation, just a little bit crazy. Number six, her buddy, Dr. Phil. Oprah's not just responsible for many hopes and dreams being squashed live on air, but she is also the creator of many talk show celebrities, like health expert Dr. Oz and life coach. Dr. Phil. Before Dr. Phil had his own show, Oprah had asked him and his courtroom consulting firm to help with the trial. Now, before even meeting Oprah, Phil actually had zero interest in being a television personality, but Oprah decided, hey, I'm gonna force this guy to do it, you know, convince him, make him see the light. According to Phil, she helped him understand the power of these shows and what they were truly made for. 
profit. For Phil, he brings people on his show who are struggling with personal issues that just so happen to be great for television, like the Cash Me Outside girl. Dr. Phil made her famous, cause that's fair. But it's not just Phil that's had some controversial moments. Her other protege, Dr. Oz, has had a lot of rough moments over the years. His show is centered around medicine and health. He brings so-called health experts on week after week. My mom used to love this show, so unfortunately I'm very familiar with this man. Oprah was partnered with both of these people, meaning that whenever they got money, she got some of it too. She doesn't like to advertise how much she actually makes from these guys, but considering how many episodes they have and how long the programs have been running for, it's probably a decent little chunk of cash. Number five, you know, let's get into some of the celebrities that don't like Oprah now, because honestly, there's not a lot of secrets that haven't been revealed. Number five, Seth MacFarlane. The creator of Family Guy and the TED series is not a fan of Oprah Winfrey. During the whole 2020 situation with masks and the isolation and you know what I'm talking about, Seth decided to share some words of wisdom about Oprah Winfrey. He started by acknowledging that Oprah had done some pretty altruistic things with her career, but that she has used her platform to amplify the voices of outlandish characters rather than legitimate scientists or medical professionals. The post included a link to the LA Times that discussed misinformation from Dr. Phil and of course from Dr. Oz. He was claiming that a ton of what was discussed on their shows was nothing more than misinformation and entertaining disasters. The Cash Me Outside girl, the purple guy who drank silver water like it was his job, and so many more that I can't actually talk about on the internet. He called Oprah out for starting out as a legitimate show with the goal of education, and instead it just kind of morphed into this misinformative cartoon. Number four. Rose McGowan. A ton of A-listers out there will be on Oprah's side through thick and thin. That's just the way it is. However, Scream alumni and Me Too activist Rose McGowan is not one of those people. Former Charm star tweeted a photo from 2014 involving Oprah Winfrey kissing the cheek of one of the most disgraced men in Hollywood history. I can't say his name and we can't put pictures of him up on this video, but he looks like Java the Hutt and he worked with Quentin Tarantino, so I'm just gonna call him Java the Hutt for the rest of this video. The photo was taken from the 2014 Critics' Choice Awards. She posted on Twitter that she was glad to see the ugly truth about Oprah coming to light. She wished Oprah were real, but she's not. She's as fake as they come. Hashtag lizard. Now she didn't add that last part, but I did. Winfrey claimed she didn't know what was going on back then and regretted being so close to such a terrible man. A terrible man that I really wish we could talk about, but <laughs> can't do that. No, it's not happening. Number three. Kid Rock. Kid has never been shy about his opinions on anything, especially when it comes to Oprah. A while back, Kid Rock was escorted out of his own steakhouse in Nashville, Tennessee for ranting about Oprah in a no-no juice fueled tirade. He told TMZ that his PR team actually tried to get him on Oprah at one point and Oprah's team just wanted Kid to write down five reasons why he loved Oprah's show. That was it. And he said F that and threw that offer out the window. Over the following years and to this day, he's tweeted his opinions and feelings about Oprah, with the big summary being that he just kinda doesn't vibe with her. Literally saying that he could not explain why, maybe it was just because he didn't believe she was nice or charitable, but he was certain that she was secretly a menace and Look where we are now. Number two, Mel Gibson. All right, there has been a ton of misinformation spread across the internet since this whole Oprah thing has gone down. For a while, people believed that Jason Momoa and Tom Hanks had inside information on Oprah and that it needed to be shared with the world, but that was all a lie and neither of those people ever actually said a word about Oprah. Another celebrity brought into this mix is Mel Gibson. This man is fueled by controversy, so it's understandable. For the past few weeks, clips and comments have been making their way across the globe, alleging that Mel Gibson has this inside scoop on Oprah's secret agenda, that he's ready to share it with the world. But once again, this is a lie. It turns out that someone out there loves using AI to make stuff, and it would appear that someone somewhere wrote controversial Oprah into a bar and bam, there was a script. Now, I don't use AI for a lot of stuff, so I'm not really sure if that's the process or not, so that could have been a silly sentence to say. Mel has spoken out claiming that he has never actually received any inside information on Oprah, and that he's been fairly neutral on the whole Maui thing, so the so-called hate towards her is just 
doesn't exist. And at number one, the Maui Fund scandal. Now, who would have guessed this lady who was famous for handing out cars on her show got canceled by the world? Well, it's probably because she made a career-ending mistake when herself and Dwayne broke the one rule of being rich, don't ask poor people for their money. A while ago, Oprah and The Rock announced that they would be starting a relief fund for the victims of Maui, and the People's Fund of Maui was given a solid like $10 million to get off the ground, which is great, $10 million, it's a lot of money, donated by Oprah Winfrey and Dwayne Johnson combined. So why is it just Oprah that gets so much hate? Well, it's cause she has a net worth of like $2.8 billion, which is a lot of money. The world is collectively furious at Oprah for having the audacity to ask working class citizens for charity when most people can barely afford to put food on their table. Not to mention the $5 million that Oprah actually put into the fund, it turns out was taxed money, so it's not actually her money. She was just like, oh, that's nice. I'm just gonna put this in here for now. The Rock and Oprah donated $5 million each, which is great, but again, $5 million to Oprah is like $500 to us. It's not a lot. Oprah addressed all the hate online, telling the Daily Mail that she's just disappointed in the reaction from the world. No one is focusing on the good things in the people of Maui. Instead, the world is just mad that she asked them to give her a nickel. Number 10, Lance Armstrong. Seven-time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong has gone down in history as a man who is unable to ride a bike without chemical training wheels. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey from 2013, Lance was brought on to discuss the allegations floating around regarding his status as a Tour de France winner. While several sources claimed that Lance had, several sources claimed that Lance had to take performance-enhancing substances to win each and every race, as well as a type of transfusion involving the red life juice that lives inside of all of us. Armstrong went on air and. In up to every single thing that they were claiming he had done. However, he did deny the notion that he was some kind of like a mastermind who would control his teammates and force them to join in his extracurricular activities. But amidst his admission of guilt, say that 10 times fast, there was a moment where he tried to pin the situation on his battle with cancer. He wraps it up by saying that he should have tried harder to cancel the culture rather than create more of a problem. He was stripped of all seven Tour de France titles and has since lived in exile among the cycling world. Number nine, the fabricated memoir. Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment from her talk show that turned any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September 2005, Winfrey picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Frett about his years long struggle with substance control issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best selling nonfiction book of the year, and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called Gut Wrenching. However, the following year, a news outlet ran a very expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there's a section of the book that he tells the story of surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers when he was never on that train or even involved in that in any way, shape, or form. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed, a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. She asked why James felt the need to lie to herself and her readers, and he tried everything, making every excuse in the world. He claimed that he altered a lot of the details, but that the overall plot was real, you know? The studio audience responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps, and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience, as it wasn't her intention, but the damage was already done, and his career as a writer is non-existent. Number eight, Kid Rock. Kid has never been shy about his opinions on anything, especially when it comes to Oprah Winfrey. A while back, Kid Rock was escorted out of his own steakhouse in Nashville for ranting about Oprah in a no-no juice fuel tirade. He told TMZ that his PR team actually tried to get him on the Oprah show at one point. Oprah's team just wanted him to write down five reasons why he loved her show, and he said F that and threw away that piece of paper that they gave him. Over the following years and to this day, he has tweeted his opinions and feelings about Oprah with the big summary being that he just kind of doesn't vibe with her. Literally saying that he couldn't explain why he hated her, maybe it was because he didn't believe that she was nice or charitable, but that he was certain that she was secretly a menace. Kid's career hasn't been great in general, but these comments about Oprah did not help his case. Number seven, David Letterman. A majority of the world believes that Oprah's feud with David Letterman dates back to 1995 after he 
he made an awkward joke at the Academy Awards. But Letterman claims that their beef actually started a lot earlier than that. According to an interview between David and late night host Jon Stewart, David claims that his feud with Oprah began many years before the Oscars. He explained that he ran into Oprah when they were both on vacation with other people and explained that she was with Stedman at the time and he was with his then girlfriend Regina. David decided it would be funny to prank Oprah one day at lunch. The story goes that the waiter walked past him and he simply pointed to Oprah and said, that woman right there, yep, yeah, she's been kind enough to take care of our check. They then got up and left Oprah with the bill. Yeah, I'm not surprised that she's not stoked about that. Even millionaires don't appreciate sneaky people. Winfrey has never cited that as being the source of her anger though. Apparently she felt the feud began when she was a guest on his talk show in 1986. David continued to make rude jokes at her expense and made her feel extremely uncomfortable. She didn't speak to him for 16 years after that. Now David is a strange man, especially when it comes to female guests, so it's no surprise that she was uncomfortable the entire time. Number six, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata or an unwelcome person to Oprah Winfrey after she was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that their feud was addressed. Turns out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after 2006 and Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading to a hilariously adorable moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was mad at her, to which Oprah replied, why am I mad at you? I thought you were mad at me. <laughs> what? They mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone and figured things out like adults. Number five, Seal. This man may be known for his vocal chops, but he really should be known for his meme making abilities. Just days after the Golden Globe, Seal posted a meme on Instagram consisting of several photos of Oprah Winfrey cozying up with a man whose name I can't say on the internet because he's heinous. So he's just, uh, he's the guy who produced half of Quentin Tarantino's movies. He was the main cause of the Me Too movement and we're gonna call him Java the Hutt for this list. Oprah and Java were photographed spending time together and one photo even made it look like Oprah was pushing singer Rita Ora towards Mr. Hutt. Seal captioned the image by saying a bunch of stuff that I'm not allowed to quote because the gosh darn internet. The meme itself read, when you have been part of the problem for a decade, but suddenly they all think you are the solution. I'm not sure how deep this feud goes, but on the surface, it seems that Seal has been trying to warn us about some things for years. Number four, Ice Cube. Ice may have gotten his career thanks to his epic music chops, but both as a solo artist as well as his time with the NWA, but these days you probably know him as the guy from Ride Along or 21 Jump Street. Ice Cube started acting in movies in 1991, debuting in the film Boys in the Hood as Doughboy. He continued to act over and over again, starring in movies like Friday, Anaconda, and my favorite, are we there yet? His dislike for Oprah comes from the fact that while he has starred in several films and has become more wildly known for that, she never invited him onto the show. She's even asked his co-stars to appear more often than himself on multiple occasions. In 2006, Ice Cube expressed his frustrations, saying that his barbershop co-stars Cedric the Entertainer and Eve were invited onto the show while he was left onto the sidelines. He pointed out how crazy it is that she has all of these people with dark pasts and convictions onto her show, plus if he wasn't a rags to riches story, who was? If you don't know that story, I recommend you watch the film Straight Outta Compton from 2015. It received massive critical success and it's never mentioned on Oprah's show once, so go check it out. Number three, Angelina Jolie. You would imagine that two people who consider themselves to be humanitarians would agree on something, but apparently that's just not the case between Angelina Jolie and Oprah Winfrey. According to an insider close to Miss Winfrey, Angelina actually refused to help Oprah launch her Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa. According to the source, Oprah reached out seeking celebrity sponsorship and public backing for her project, but when she reached out to Angelina, she was met with a swift no. Oprah assumed that Angelina, of all people, would jump at the chance to represent such an incredible cause, especially considering how much Angelina apparently just loved Africa. But the no was a devastation, and she would never ask for Angie's help again. Many believe the hate towards Oprah stems from her decision to publicly side with Jennifer Aniston after Angelina had split from Brad Pitt. To be fair to Oprah, that split came literally weeks before the whole Brangelina thing became public, so eh. Number two, Ludacris. Ludacris appeared on Oprah in 2004 to promote the film Crash. 
He claimed that Oprah ambushed him with criticism about hip hop lyrics instead of talking about the critically acclaimed movie that he was there to plug. Luda has since claimed that Oprah edited the show to make herself seem more favorable to her audience. He said that during a separate interview, she edited out a lot of his comments while keeping her own in. Of course, it's her show, but they were doing a show on racial discrimination and she gave Luda a hard time as a rapper when he came onto the show as an actor. Luda revealed that his interview was extremely last minute, not knowing if it was a real thing until roughly 24 hours before. Following the interview on Oprah, she pulled Luda aside to a green room where he claims to have been berated by the talk show host. According to Oprah, having a rapper on her show just made her feel like she was empowering them. He said it was like being at someone's house who just didn't want you to be there. At that point, he had already been uncomfortable, but that was just a little cherry on top. Her main concern was his use of the N-word in lyrics, but he quickly pointed out the hypocrisy of having people like Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock onto the show who were famous for using the slur in their sets. Oprah's shadiness was on full display following the interview from Luda. And at number one, Mel Gibson. Now there was a ton of misinformation spread across the internet since Oprah's whole situation went down. For a while, people believed that Jason Momoa and Tom Hanks had inside information on Oprah and that it needed to be shared, but that was all a lie and neither of those people ever said a word about Oprah. Another celebrity that's been brought into this mix is Mel Gibson, a man fueled by controversy. For the past few weeks, clips and comments have been making their way across the globe, alleging that Mel Gibson has inside information on Oprah's secret agenda. Yeah, ready to share it with the entire world, but that, once again, is a lie. It turns out that there are people out there who just love using AI to make stuff up. It would appear that someone somewhere wrote controversial Oprah into a bar and BAM! Mel Gibson's on the headline. Now, I don't use AI for a lot. I'm not I'm not actually sure if you like put it in a search bar. I don't know how AI works. But Mel has spoken out claiming that he's never received any inside information and that he was fairly neutral on his so-called hate. So, if you see anything about Mel on the internet, just know it's probably not true. <laughs>